For two games in Oakland, the A's did everything well. Their defense was strong. Their pitching was dominating. And they had late inning magic when they needed it, and thus went to Boston with visions of a sweep. But in game three at Fenway, the A's fell apart, combining base running blunders with four errors in the first four innings. Then in the 11th, the Sox Fenway power finally arrived. High in the air, Burns is back at the warning track at the wall. It's gone! And the Red Sox have stayed alive! Now Oakland again goes for that elusive clinching victory with ace Tim Hudson. It's win now for the A's or face Pedro in a decisive game five tomorrow. Game four is next. It's Fenway Park the day after. A bright, sunshiny, partly cloudy day in New England. October baseball at Fenway, and the Red Sox are just thrilled to have another game. For a while, it looked like there would not be one more. The Athletics were hoping there would not be one more. And the Red Sox, well, they might get greedy now. They might want two more. Certainly, we know they're going to play game four here today. John Burkett, a 12 game winner in the regular season, gets the call. He's Boston's starter in this critical game. The A's will go with their ace, Tim Hudson, but on only three days of rest. Hello, everyone. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan, and here we go. The Boston Red Sox almost eliminated last night. They were shut down again by this outstanding Oakland pitching, and yet they won that ball game. And here is Oakland seven times in the last four years, Joe. They've had a chance to eliminate another team, and they have not won a single one of those games. Now, the Red Sox feel the pressure has moved over to the Oakland clubhouse, knowing that they have to face Pedro tomorrow if there's a game five. What do you think? Well, I don't... The Oakland A's had a foul to take yesterday. They have one more today. But... The leaders of the Oakland A's have to tell their teammates, we lost the game yesterday. It wasn't about the umpires. It was our poor, poor base running. We made the four errors. That was yesterday. Let's go out and win today. No pressure. We are still in command of this series. That's what you have to say to your teammates if you're a leader of the Oakland A's. All right. Whether or not they'll be able to pull that off remains to be seen. One thing is for sure, the Red Sox are still in there and suddenly they feel that the whole thing is turned around. John Burkett gets the call. Burkett heading in for the bullpen now. Moments away from getting started. Miguel Tejada, the MVP in the league last year, he'll be coming up in the very first inning. It becomes a very difficult sun field. And uh, we've seen that at various times. Lou Pinella in the 78 sudden death playoff between the Yankees and Red Sox made a play even though he never saw the ball. And had he not made that play, could have turned that whole playoff game around. So there are things to, uh, little hazards that could be out there today if the sun stays out unique to Fenway Park. Jermaine Dye will be the right fielder for the Athletics today. The big crowd has gathered, and uh, again, we've had that electricity, that energy pulsing through Fenway Park. And they're playing the uh, Red Sox theme song for the year. Cowboy up on the sound system right now as the Red Sox take the field. Manny Ramirez leading them out, heading out into left field. And the Red Sox will be hoping that Manny today will find his stroke. He's had only one hit in 12 at-bats in this series. David Ortiz, no hits yet. Let's take a look at the Oakland batting order now, presented by Bristol Myers Squibb. It'll be Mark Ellis back in the leadoff spot at second base. Rubiel Durazo, the DH. Eric Chavez, who is headless in this series. At third base, Miguel Tejada, who has only one hit in the series in 15 at-bats at shortstop. Scott Hatterberg at first. Jose Guillen is back in there in left field. Adam Melhew is the catcher. Ramon Hernandez a late scratch because of a strained lower back. Jermaine Dye in right field, and Eric Burns is in center field, hitting ninth. And for the Boston Red Sox, the pitcher is the 38-year-old right-hander, John Burkett. And the uh, New Englanders are... A little bit tense about Burkett out there, who oftentimes had a hard time in first innings of games. Well, I think John Burkett is a veteran, though, John. He's been in these positions before. He knows what he has to do. And I think the key is going to be him staying ahead of the hitters because these Oakland A's seemed a little anxious in yesterday's ball game. If he can get ahead of them, he'll be able to get them to go out of the strike zone. Also with us today again is Gary Miller. Let's go down in the field to Gary. 
John, John Burkett's first inning problems are well documented. His first inning ERA is 10.13. The A's know about it, but they said they won't change their approach. The Red Sox know about it. Two things they do with John. Sometimes they vary the number of pitches he throws in the pen, anywhere from 20 to 40. Today he threw the most he's thrown all year, over 45 warm-up pitches and seven long tosses, just to get himself a little heated and in the game. Grady Little said he needs his control. Sometimes he doesn't throw hard enough to register on the gun. So watch for home plate Jerry Davis to set the strike zone. Burkett's got to have control of that strike zone, and that's going to be critical to him today in this first inning. All right, so this will be one we'll have to watch closely that first inning with Burkett. Grady Little, he says uh, everybody's available in the bullpen today other than Pedro, who will be the fifth game starter if there is a fifth, a fifth game, and Derek Lowe, who was last night's starter. And even Mike Timlin will be available, although he pitched three innings here last night, although he said he will try to limit what Timlin does in this game if he feels he has to use it. And there's Derek Lowe. And last night he had a full head of hair, but apparently he too succumbed to the Barbers Clippers after the game last night. And there's ball one. We are underway at Fenway Park. The uh, sun has drifted behind a cloud for the moment. And that is a strike on the outside. Ellis has had two hits in ten at bats, plus three walks in this series. Oakland's team batting average in the series is only 180. So it, it, the two big sluggers, Tejada, who is one for 15, and Chavez, who is 0 for 14, obviously have struggled big time. But uh, most of the team has has not hit. That's in the left center. Going back is Damon, and he gets there. One away. Well, the defense is going to play a big part in this ball game for the Red Sox because they will put the ball in play. Burkett's not going to strike out a lot of hitters, and as you see there, Damon runs it down in center field. Ramirez has played well in left. Nixon has a bad leg, so we're going to have to see how well he's able to move around there and right. And we know Todd Walker's had some problems at second base in this series, so uh, the Red Sox defense is going to have to step up today, or is it Cowboy up? <laughs> I, I believe Joe here in Boston uh, the correct terminology is cowboy up. okay and I'm, I'm impressed that you're getting into that whole uh, thing now <laughs> oh and one to Durazo Durazo three hits and 12 at bats in the series including a double he's had three runs batted in curveball from Burkett and that is low one ball one strike and you see what Burkett does he'll try to throw you a strike try to get ahead in the count then he'll try to get you to help him out by swinging at pitches out of the strike zone. So that's in there for a strike. One ball and two strikes. Well, the, the last four years, this year included, the A's have now lost seven games in which they had an opportunity to clinch a postseason series. That is the longest losing streak of, it, of its kind in Major League history. And that's just off the outside. And that's Burkett at his best, just on the edge, just off the edge. And you can see the just on the edge for strike two, just off the edge here. That's the way he pitches. So good four inches or more off the outside corner. These are the two inch demarcation off the outside corner, delineated there. Two and two the count. And that is a base hit to left field. So Durasso gets the first hit of the game. And now the big Oakland sluggers, Chavez and Tejada, who have been shut down just as much as have Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz on the Red Sox side. Well, he can't pitch up, and this ball is going to be up. He doesn't throw hard enough up to get anybody out, and that pitch is up. DeRazzo does a good job, doesn't try to pull it, just lines it to left field. But, John, I don't think this pressure of the fact they haven't been able to close anyone out comes into effect until tomorrow. You know, today is still, you know, not really elimination day. It's just the way we can win. But tomorrow is elimination for both if they have a game five. Curveball misses to Eric Chavez. Well, they had three of those kind of games against the Yankees a couple years ago and lost all three of them. They had two of them against Minnesota last year, lost both of those. They've had one so far in this series and lost it. Yeah, but I don't think you, if you're in the A's clubhouse and you're up 2 0 and you lose a ball game, ever how, doesn't matter how you lose it. You have to say to yourself, we had a foul to take. I mean, they really did. I mean, and, and they took the foul yesterday. You don't want to take another one today. I really you're, you're getting into that NBA. Well I love it. You know I'm an NBA guy and I mean now I'm cowboy up and everything yeah, they, you know and a couple of fouls to use. Yeah. Say how to Chavez the two Oakland sluggers 
for the combined one hit. Actually, I have him for one for 29 on my sheet. And Ramirez and Ortiz only one for 25 combined. Chavez with a high pop-up. Coming over is Millar. And just not enough room in this ballpark. That would have been the easy catch for him to make at the Oakland Coliseum. Where I don't know if any of these uh, seats within 20 rows of the dugout at Fenway would uh, be there if this were Oakland. I mean, they're, they're, those seats are set way back at the Coliseum. And that's the, the panoramic look from high above Fenway Park. John, you mentioned how these both of these sluggers on the sluggers on both teams are struggling. The main reason is they're going out of the strike zone. That curveball in the dirt. Full count now. And both both sides, I mean, I'm watching Tejada, I'm watching Chavez. All of them, they're going out of the strike zone. They're not being patient, you know, to get the base hit. Once, you know, you start struggling, then you get a little bit over anxious and you start swinging the bad pitches. The same thing on the Boston side with Ramirez and Ortiz. They're doing the exact same thing. All four of these good hitters are struggling because they're going out of the zone. There goes Durazo. And a high fly ball into left center. That's Damon flipping the glasses down. He's all the way back on the warning track near the 379 market where he caught it. The wind is blowing out toward right field right now. Well, you know, the A's are doing something different. They put Durazo in motion there. I don't necessarily like to put a guy in motion when you have a slugger at the plate because then he has to swing three and one. Let him choose the pitch to drive. And then if it happens to be a ball, then he doesn't have to swing. Three and two, I'm sorry, but you don't have to swing. You don't want him to feel like he's got to protect. You want him to still hit. So now Tejada, and that curveball drops in there for a called strike. Tejada, one hit, 15 at bats in the series. And he was distraught last night after the ball game and basically told the writers when they came to his locker that he really just, he was upset and he didn't want to talk. Tejada with a high foul. Down the right field line, Millar ranging down the line for it, and again, not enough room to go get it, as it is in amongst the spectators down there. Tim Hudson looking on. He'll be heading out there in the last half of this inning, and he'd like to have a lead. Two down with a runner at first here. By the way, Joe, seeing Damon go back to the warning track for that fly ball just hit by Chavez. We never saw that last night. Other than the home run that ended the game, there was just one ball hit deep to the outfield. Kapler caught that one for well, the Red Sox. Completely different pitcher. Burkett doesn't have the great sinker like Derek Lowe had. That one is again a foul off the right field line and back into the crowd. Only 302 feet to that foul pole, by the way, in right field. There it is. 302 feet if you hit it right down the line. But if you hit it. 15 20 feet away from the foul pole then you had to hit about 370 380 feet to get it to the wall still on two and two Tejada who has yet to break loose in this series Durazo the runner first not Tejada time waiting backs away I've only seen one Oakland A's hitter try to attack that left field wall and that was Ramon Hernandez yesterday he had some real good cuts when he got ahead and here we see Tejada kind of flipping the right and that tells me that they're not really attacking the ball doesn't mean you always try to pull the ball there but if he throws you something off speed it becomes very easy to hit that wall in left field if you're a right handed hitter just a routine fly ball will be off the wall. Eric Burns looking on from the dugout. A ball and two strikes. There's that wall. 37 feet, two inches high. And it seems like it's right over the shoulder of the shortstop. One ball and two strikes to Tejada. 27 homers, 106 RBIs during the season. Slider off the outside. Two and two. He's kind of shown some pretty good patience here. Yeah, but you see, this is John Burkett. He's going to throw a lot of pitches, and he has to throw a lot of pitches because he can't put the hitters away like going 0-2 and, and then blow a high fastball by them as we saw Lily do last night. What he'll have to do is nibble, nibble, and try to get them to go after a pitch. And what you see is him throwing a lot of pitches during the first inning, even though they've only, you know, they don't have a lot of runners on. Tejada to first, and that's foul. Malar made a dive for it, but it was foul anyway. 
Still two balls, two strikes. That's 21 pitches thrown by Burkett already here in the first inning. Burkett, Gary Miller mentioned the, the first inning blues that Burkett has had so many times this year. Opposing hitters have a 367 batting average. They're all Ty Cobb against Burkett in first innings of games this year. That was Cobb's lifetime average, but only a 258 average the rest of the time. Well, Tejada thought that he just yeah. walked, but that was ball three. Well, that should tell you something right there, Miguel. I think you have to focus a little bit better. I mean, to me, if you lose track of the count, it tells me that you are not really focusing on what you're up there to do. You're just swinging the bat, hitting. That was a 2-2 pitch that became ball three. Four, four balls for a walk. There goes the runner, Tejada, in the right. Here comes Nixon, and that's the inning. One hit, one left. Burkett has made it through the first. Now, the Red Sox coming up. No more hitting second. ESPN's presentation of the 2003 MLB Division Series. Brought to you by Radio Shack. You could win World Series tickets for life. Through October 13th, collect commemorative postcards with holograms at Radio Shack while supplies last. Then watch the World Series and you could win. Now the Red Sox up against the ace right-handed Tim Hudson of the Athletics. Oakland did not score in its first inning. Always a, a checkpoint for a John Burkett start that first inning. Now the Red Sox batting order presented by Bristol Myers Squibb. It'll be Damon in center. Garcia Parra at short. Todd Walker back in there in the starting lineup at second. Manny Ramirez in left. David Ortiz the DH. Kevin Millar at first hitting sixth. Trot Nixon last night's hero in right field. Bill Miller in the eighth spot hitting uh, eighth at third base. Jason Veritek the catcher bats ninth. And the Oakland pitcher Tim Hudson. But they had a, a great out, a, an outstanding season. But working on short rest or three days of rest well John here's the key the work the key to working on three days or short rest is the mental approach if you think you can do it you can get the job done if you have a mentally you're not prepared to do it that's when it hurts you physically but I mean physically everybody can pitch on three days rest if, if they can put their minds to it uh, let's think about it we've had guys you know Bob Gibson worked on two days rest in the World Series uh, uh, Mickey Lowledge, all those guys worked on two days rest. So you know that if they can work on two, you can work on three. So it's all about the mental approach that Hudson takes today. If he thinks he can, do, he's just as good, well, he probably will be. Joe and one, the cat to Damon. And that's a foul. Hudson, he got a fastball that, that he sinks, but he also has a, a devastating split finger pitch. Hudson last year pitched game four on three days of rest at the Metrodome, went only three into third innings. And gave up seven runs on five hits, but the defense played poorly behind him. Right. Only two of those runs were earned. And not only that, you're playing on carpet, and he's a sinker ball pitcher. Big difference. Here's Tejada, and he throws out Damon for out number one. Damon now four for 14 in this series. Well, let's look at this Oakland defense, and the I'm only sure one that's really proven to be a gold glove winner is Chavez at third base. Uh, they made four errors last night in the ball game. And it really hurt them. But I think this is the best outfield they have with Dye, Gian, and Burns out there. They can cover some ground. That is their best outfield. And Dye throws well in right field. Gian throws well in left field. So I think defensively, this is their best outfield. One down, and here's no more. Last, last night, they really didn't need any defense in the outfield. The Red Sox almost never hit any balls to the outfield. The only time any Oakland outfielder ever had to go back on a ball was when Nixon hit the game ending home run. Nomar helped him out on that one. Oh, and won the count. Nomar has been Boston's top hitter, at least in terms of getting hits in this postseason. Five hits, 12 at bats, a 417 average. He's also had three walks. Hudson keeping the ball down against him. The count quickly is 0 and 2. Kind of interesting there. Mel Hughes set up inside there. Hudson threw a sinker away. And, and I would wonder myself, why would you want to throw a ball inside? with that short left field fence when he just swung at one in the dirt <laughs> and he did it and luckily for Hudson he did throw it low and away and he swung at it 
And he swung at that one too. Right. I mean, why would you go inside if a guy has helped you out already on the first pitch that you've almost bounced up there? So Nomar I mean, looked like a little over anxious up there. Well, there's a good slider from Hudson. First pitch was a sinker and then two sliders. I mean, no, no reason to pitch him inside. Might miss with it, and he hit it up over that little green monster in left field. No reason to pitch him inside. No reason to throw him a strike. Exactly. Now here's Todd Walker. Two down, nobody on. Walker with a pop up. Looking up into the bright sky. Chavez is called up by Tejada, who makes the catch. So, a very quick, strong inning. Nine pitches thrown by Hudson. No score. Scott Hatterberg leads off here for the Athletics against John Burkett. And that sinker is low for ball one. Now, this is not an ordinary start for Burkett, and I don't mean, you know, it's a huge start and everything's riding on it. I mean, in a normal start, he'd be looking to go fairly deep into the game. But the Red Sox, if he can just keep him right there, even for three, four innings, uh, that gives him plenty of chance to go to the bullpen. They got plenty of guys to go the rest of the way today. I'm sure that. Brady Little will not allow him to uh, get in too much trouble before he thinks about making a move. Last night, the Boston bullpen, which has been uh, so uh, spotty all year long, four perfect innings, three of them from Timlin and one from Scott Williamson. And by the way, Williamson pitched rather than Byung Hyun Kim last night. Turned out Kim's shoulder was a little stiff. That is inside, so Burkett has walked Hatterberg to start off the inning. Timlin, despite three innings last night, according to Little, is available today for a uh, you know, short I think everybody's available today, and if there is a tomorrow, they're all available yeah. then, too. So everyone will tell him, I can give you an out, I can give you an inning, I can give you three hitters. I mean, they'll all tell him what they can do or what they feel like they can do. Jose Guillen is uh, left hand with the broken bone, the handmade bone. Was bothering him yesterday, and he was out of the lineup. Back in there today, and that sinker low and outside. He in one hit, four at bats in the series with a couple of walks. No score in the second inning. If the A's continue to show patience, they're going to get Burkett in trouble. But you know he relies on them going out of the zone. Even if he can, get, if even when he's behind in the count, he still tries to get you to help him out. And ball two. Oakland hitting only 180 in the series as we mentioned they have picked up 15 walks in three games and they've had three batters hit by pitches. She went all the count and he gets that outside corner strike it is two and one now. Adam Melhew's on deck now last night you know there was so much controversy in the ball game with uh, rules interpretations by the umpires. The umpires were part of the post game press conferences yesterday. And that's a foul. It will come back and out of play. Now it's two and two to Guillen. And uh, I think the whole baseball world was talking about the interpretation on the play where Tejada was not allowed to score after he was obstructed by Bill Miller. And they're still talking about it here at Fenway Park this morning. Steve Palermo, uh, a former outstanding. American League up right now, an umpiring supervisor here again today. Two and two the count. Right up the middle, base hit. Omar made a uh, gout, a, uh, a gallant effort for it, but it was past him. And uh, two men around with nobody out for Oakland. Gary Miller's here with us, Gary. Adam Miller is in the lineup today, a late change from our own Hernandez, whose back stiffened up last night. And in fact, he's probably not available even to pinch hit today, and his status for game five unknown. Now, he does have some pop. He hit five home runs in limited activity this year. All right, so here is Mel Hughes. Mel Hughes had only 77 at bats. He did have five homers and 14 driven in, so he did some slugging in the, uh, the few opportunities he had. And he has a liner for a base hit. Now holding it second was Hatterberg to make sure that wasn't caught by Todd Walker and the bases are now loaded and good base running there by Hatterberg. I mean you have to start back on any line drives hit behind you. So he, he wasn't able to score but he was going to stay out of the double play with no one out. You always have to 
be aware of the line drive. Fastball, that's pretty much in the middle of the plate. And anytime Burkett gets the ball in the middle of the plate, guys are going to have good swings at him. And here's the, here's the thing. If you're the A's, you know, Jermaine Dye has done, he's been an RBI man his entire career. He struggled a lot lately, but he's probably the guy that you would like to have up there in this situation right now. Dye takes a strike. Dye with five hits and 15 career at bats against Burkett, including a home run. Yeah, but you look at his numbers for the year, it's just a, a just complete right. loss. Yeah. Well, he's had so many injuries the last two years, but. And the curveball drops in there. Strike two. The first pitch was a very good pitch by Burkett. He's been starting guys off away and trying to nibble. He just came right after Die with a fastball on the inside corner, and then he threw in the big slow curveball. Oakland with a a chance at a big inning here. The bases are loaded with nobody out. Die the hitter, Eric Burns on deck. Hatterberg led off the inning with a walk. He's at third. Guillen hit a single. He's at second. Then Mel Hughes just hit a single. Three men on, nobody out. Off the outside with that fastball. Actually, that was a pretty good fastball there. The first pitch he threw to die in that one. That they had a lot of movement on both of those pitches. Red Sox have the infield looking for the double play. Did exchange a run to get the double play here. They want to stay out of the big inning. That is a foul. Pass through. A very defensive looking hack there by Die with two strikes. Well, once you get two strikes on you, I think you have to put the ball in play. Because even if he hits into a double play, they'll get a run. I know it doesn't sound logical, but in this instance, you have to try to score. If you can break on top, I mean, it changes the way, you know, the Red Sox will view this ball game. Was this kind of situation last night where everything just became totally bizarre for the athletics last night. Right. And he struck him out with a no no. Foul he ball. foul tipped that ball. It is not a strikeout. That was that was <laughs> I can't believe he got a piece of that one. That ball never it looked like it never started in the strike zone but he did get a piece of it. And that's what you call good hitting. <laughs> Even though you're swinging a bad pitch if you make contact with two strikes it's still good hitting. See how far that ball's out of the strike zone. That one is a base hit to left field. One run is in. Now being waved home. Nope. Guillen's going to stop at third as the throw comes in. See that's why I said that was good hitting the pitch before. If you stay alive and get one more pitch to hit you count on the pitcher not being able to make as good a pitch on the next next one and that's the case there he made a great pitch die fouled it off and now he hangs a curveball so that's a curve well he didn't hang that one either but it's just that's good hitting again that's good hitting that's plate coverage at its best that ball is off the plate outside and he reaches out and gets it not as tough a pitch as the one he fouled off before but when you have two strikes all you want to do is stay alive and hope that you get a pitch to hit on the next pitch and that's what happened there with die. The one thing I've always believed in, John, you can struggle, have bad seasons, things don't go well. But if you were an RBI man, when you get in that position, you're still an RBI man. You still know how to hit in those situations. That's why I say Dye was the right guy to be up there if you're the Oakland A's. Bronson Arroyo up in the Boston bullpen. Burkett got through the first today, but now it's the second inning that's giving him trouble. And here is Eric Burns, and he'd like to atone for really the... Uh, the, the bonehead play last night he just did not touch home plate they were all screaming at him from the dugout to go back and touch it he even managed to shove the catcher in frustration over his pain but he did not ever touch the plate and that's down toward Johnny Pesky's pole in the right field corner and just foul only 302 feet from home plate to that pole and he almost tucked one in well I tell you one other thing you better look up and see where the runners are he ran past die at first base to him. I mean he was like he was running with his head down again. And if he would have passed die of course you know he, he's out. You see how close to the pole that one goes. Wow. Every once in a while you'll see somebody tuck one in down. Yeah there. you're right. That was close. The wind is blowing in that direction out toward right. 
So Burns, every once in a while you see a guy hit a home run and then run past right. his own runner, and he only gets credit for a single. Now the pitch. That is in for a called strike. One ball and two strikes now to Burns. Mark Ellis is on deck. Already a run in for the Athletics, and they really have a chance here to get a big early lead. And Burns might be the key to the whole thing. He's had five hits in nine at bats in this series. He had a three hit game last night. Just inside. Nice try there by Burkett. He was trying to sneak a fastball on the inside corner and finish him off. You see the target inside and it's up and in. Two and two the count. Again, Boston's middle infield double play depth. They're pulled in at the corners. Miller at third, Millar at first. Guillen, Mel Hughes, and Die, the three base runners. They're waiting for Burns to get back in the box here. There's Guillen, Mel Hughes, and Die. The crowd very quiet, very tense at the moment. Working in uh, extreme trouble. Goes back in there again, and he wanted that call. Three and two. Jerry Davis, the home plate umpire today, he said no, that was also too far in. Same pitch almost, just a little lower. His own showed that one being a good four inches off the inside. Full count. He needs to make a pitch here. And as a top fly, backpedaling is Walker. The infield fly rule is called, so the out was automatic on that pop up as it turned down. So Burns does not get anybody home. That's a, a huge out for John Burkett. Second baseman. Well, it was a huge out because Burkett was in a real jam with a 3-2 pitch. He has to come and throw a strike. And he makes a good pitch. He gets the ball over the outside edge, moving away from a little bit like a little cutter. Burns just trying to put it in play, popped it up. And you see the umpires there signaling infield fly on that one. And the infield fly. The, the batter is automatically out whether the ball ends up being caught or not. And the runners advance at their own peril. That's the word we came up with last night. Peril. With, with, yeah. with Tejada as well. Well, you know. It turned out he was running at his own peril. Yeah. And was was out. So now a double play would end the inning with no further scoring. So here's Ellis, who's had two hits and 11 at bats in the series. And a curveball. That's a strike. On one. Bases loaded, one out. The sun has disappeared behind a cloud for the moment. You see no shadows at all at the moment. Another curveball and a pop-up. Millar, he's there. Out number two. Well, the A's have not been able to execute in this situation for three days, not just the last two. Another curveball, and that one's right in the middle of the plate. But Ellis was late on it and fouled it off. So neither Burns nor Ellis unable to get a runner home from third. And both were batting in a spot where they didn't necessarily have to get just put it in play. They didn't need a base hit to do it. Well, but Durazo now. But if you're the A's, again, you have the right guy up for you. If you're going to have a guy with two outs, he's the guy. He had three RBIs in game one. And again, Burkett goes to that first pitch curveball that snaps in there for a called strike. And the sun reemerges from behind that cloud. The shadows have advanced right to home plate now. Bases loaded. Two down. One run in. Chavez would be next. Guillen, Mel Hughes, and Die from third to first. Better be going anything. And he fouls it off his foot. Strike two. Good pitch by Burke. And anytime it seems like when he wants to throw the fastball, he's able to get it in tight. Whether he misses with it in or gets the edge, it's a good pitch. And that one hurt Durazo. And I don't know if it's off his foot or his leg or his knee, but he's having some uh, some trouble with it right now. Now, Rubiel Durazo from Hermosillo. 
Mexico. And he wanted us to say hello to all the folks in MSC looking in today. Oakland need that big hit. One run is in. They have three men on. Two strikes the count. Reaches for it, stays alive. Slicing it foul over toward the Boston dugout. And now Veritek's going to hand deliver the new baseball to Burkett. They're going to talk it over. Well, that was, you know, another good pitch by Burkett. That pitch was diving away from him. See, he just reaches out and gets a piece of it. And what that usually tells the catcher who is sitting there, he observes something on DeRazzo, whether he was leaning out there or pulling off. So he wants to relay that to Burkett. The catcher sees your approach. He can tell whether you're pulling off, looking for a ball inside, or whether you're going out to get a ball on the outside part of the plate. He can see that, and he can relay that to the pitcher. 0 oh, and 2. That's why they came inside. Pops him up. And here's Bill Miller. And that's the inning. So John Burkett runs the gauntlet and survives it. Just the one for Oakland. A great opportunity lost. And while Tim Hudson was on the last warm-up that he threw, he displayed something that didn't look right, and immediately trainer Larry Davis came out of the Oakland dugout, followed by Rick Peterson, the pitching coach, and manager Ken Maka. And there's some uh, concern about the physical well-being now of Tim Hudson. As they discuss things out on the mound, this was the last warm-up on the left-hand side there. He's leaving. But he is leaving this game. So Tim Hudson, who had some problems with his uh, hand, his thumb, his fingers, in game one the other night. Well, what happened in game one was it started in his forearm. He said he, he just started getting the cramp. And then all of a sudden it went down into his thumb. And that's why he was standing on the mound, twisting it, uh, you know, pushing at his back, trying to get his thumb loose. But he says it really wasn't a big deal. And uh, he just needed more time, you know, to relax his hand. That's the problem, you know, in the first game on Wednesday. As you can see, he's visibly upset here, so this has to be a lot more than what we saw on Wednesday. Steve Sparks is going to be the new Oakland pitcher, and he will get just as long as he deems necessary to warm up. And a, a huge blow to Oakland's hopes in this game is Sparks, the new pitcher. And... Uh, Obviously, Tim Hudson out of this game. And as soon as we get a report as to his uh, status, we'll pass it along too. We're hoping that it's not something real serious. Sparks warming up will return to Fenway. He's in Twins. The Yankees trying to win that division series. They lead two games to one. David Wells and Johan Santana at the Metrodome, 4 o'clock Eastern, 3 Central on ESPN. Then tonight, the deciding game five from Turner Field. Carrie Wood and the Cubs against Mike, ha uh, Mike Hampton at Atlanta. Hampton will be working on three days of rest. That's at 7.30 Eastern, 6.30 Central on Fox. This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. The Major League Baseball is giving away World Series tickets for life and other great prizes in the ultimate World Series Pass promotion presented by Radio Shack. Winning hologram numbers will be announced throughout games one through four of the series with the grand prize of World Series tickets for life announced in game four. These two ball clubs hoping to get to the 2003 World Series, but Oakland has just lost its uh, ace right-hander, Tim Hudson, and of course, Earlier this year, they lost their one of their ace left-handers, Mark Mulder, not available. He, he was already a 15-game winner and then missed the last several weeks of the season. So uh, what more hardship can Oakland endure here? They are leading this series two games to one. A few moments ago, they had the bases loaded, nobody out on a run in, and could not get anybody else home. And suddenly, they lost their starting pitcher, Tim Hudson. A lot of things went wrong for the athletics last night as well. 
Starting with this run down in the second inning, they had Veritek hung up, and then obstruction charge to Chavez, and he scored. Then on this play, it turns out Burns did not score. He was hurt. He didn't realize he hadn't touched the plate. The ball retrieved by Veritek, and he tagged him out. One run scored in that play, but Tejada ran into Bill Miller there. He thought he'd been obstructed, that would he would be awarded home plate, so he stopped running. That was a mistake, as it turns out. As uh, he was tagged out, and the umpires let that stand. So, so it went for the A's, a, a very winnable game for them last night, which they did not win. Now let's go to Gary Miller for an update on Tim Hudson's status. John, I just talked to me. Obviously, a very despondent A's dugout. Uh, Tim didn't want to leave the dugout. Larry Davis, the trainer, had to get him to go into the clubhouse for further examination, but it's his hip that's bothering him on his landing. He noticed it while he was warming up there, and so uh, obviously that's an injury he can't continue with. We'll see what we can get on uh, further clarification of what exactly caused it. Wow. And that's uh, rather ironic because that's the kind of an injury that shut down Mark Mulder. Yeah. A uh, stress fracture, a stress fracture of the hip of Mark Mulder. Hudson, he left the dugout a few moments ago to go back into the trainer's room. So everything going wrong for the athletics, but they have a lead in this game and they still have a lead in this series. Now Manny Ramirez, only one hit in 12 at bats in the series. He and Ortiz have been like Tejada and Chavez. They've just been shut down throughout the series. Sparks a knuckleballer. And that one is in there for a strike, and it's all in one. He was released by the Detroit Tigers in late August. And the A's signed into a minor league contract. They brought him up after the uh, rosters expanded on September the 2nd. And that's inside. One ball, one strike. Well, they've been getting Manny out by pitching him off the plate inside, and he's been swinging at those pitches. In batting practice today, he and Jackson, the hitting instructor, were talking about getting a strike to hit. Up the middle. Well, it wasn't well hit. But it's only the second hit that he's had in this series. Now, when you have a knuckleball pitcher out there, you may not hit a lot of them hard, but you want to just stay back through the middle so you do not pull off, and that's exactly what he did. Manny just goes right back through the middle with it, not trying to pull it. And, you know, a lot of times that's what you need. One little ground ball or something will get you started. So Ramirez is aboard. They still showed him a lot of respect last night. They walked him to get to Ortiz in a crucial situation last night. Ortiz looking for his first hit of this series. And that one drops low. Sparks, 38 years old, been pitching professionally since 1987. He's been in the big leagues with Milwaukee, Anaheim, and then Detroit. He had one excellent year. With the Tigers two years ago, he was 14 and 9. And that one is over the outside for a strike. And the sun shining again. Shadows have moved out in front of the plate, heading toward the mound. Not there yet. Ortiz has never done well against Sparks, only 4 for 23 against him. Ortiz is going to retrieve that uh, hot dog wrapper. Ortiz has actually done a little bit better against Hudson in the past than he's done against Sparks. All right, so Ortiz has done a good deed. He's gotten that hot dog wrapper. He's cleaned up some litter. Now he's back to work. Now this will go to first with it. So Ramirez moves up as Ortiz grounds out. One away. And Kevin Millar coming up. Kevin Millar, three hits and 14 at bats in this series. Millar, who was the uh, the author of that whole idea of uh, cowboy up, the, uh, the phrase that's become sort of a, a rallying cry for the Red Sox, and that's inside for a ball. Just foul. Foul by a, 
a foot or two. And down the left field line. One ball, one strike. Red Sox have a runner in scoring position here, and that has been the worst scenario for Boston so far. Only two hits in 25 at bats as a team, 0 for 10 last night in these situations. And that luck is too high. Two and one now to Milan. Trot Nixon is on deck. Well, Sparks throws a lot harder knuckleball than we saw from Wakefield the other day. Wakefield takes a little off and tries to let his dance a little bit more. Two and one. That one is squibbed. Miller, or rather Millar, thrown out by Ellis. For two minutes gone. And here comes Trot Nixon, last night's hero. And they want to salute Millar, or rather Nixon, one more time. A standing ovation for Nixon the day after his dramatic game-ending home run of last night. Manny Ramirez put in a call for it. And Nixon hit it. It's only 390 feet, this straightaway center at Fenway. The wall out there is 17 feet high. And that's ball one. Nixon batting with the runner at third here. Won't take a home run to get the job done in this spot. Well, with a knuckleball pitcher, you always have to be aware of the pass ball or the wild pitch with a runner at third. Those knuckleballs are difficult to catch. And if he throws a good one that just dances too much, he may get away. 2 0 Nixon. Showing a, a pretty keen eye for that knuckler. He's done pretty well against Sparks. In the past, he's had eight hits and 23 at bats, a 348 average, and one home run. There's Ramirez, who let off the inning with a single. He's at third now. That is foul. Into the glove of Hatterberg eventually, but only after it had kicked off foul. And Nixon is still having a problem with that calf muscle because, I mean, he was hobbling a little bit there as he started to run. Which is something we have to look for when he's in the outfield as well. Is he going to be able to cover as much ground as he normally covers? The sun has disappeared behind a cloud. Two balls of a strike to Trot Nixon. 28 homers during the season. That is caught at first. He clobbered it, and Hatterberg able to make the backhanded grab, and the inning is over. Well, the A's dodge a bullet there. So Sparks on for Hudson. It is still one to nothing Oakland as we head to the third. PN's presentation of the 2003 MLB Division Series. Brought to you by Washington Mutual Home Loans. We write our own approval rules so you can get into the house without the hassles. An equal housing lender. And strike one to Eric Chavez. Here come the Athletics now into the third. Still leading one to nothing. Chavez to Hata Hatterberg. Some power coming up for Oakland. Power that has not yet manifested itself in this series, though. Chavez now 0 for 15 after he had a fly ball to left center in the first inning of this one. And it's a foul back out of play against Burkett. And the count is a ball and two strike. By the way, Steve Sparks getting through that second inning. Really the opportunity of a, of a career for Sparks. One that he didn't know about when he got to the ballpark today, but this is his first postseason game. Rick Peterson, the pitching coach, talking with Sparks there for a moment. That one is drilled foul into the crowd. And they're in a hurry. You wonder why all of a sudden he's throwing a lot of fastballs. Well, Chavez swung and fouled the second pitch back, and he shook his head like he couldn't see it. So they tried to come back with it again. As you can see, the shadows have crept in front of home plate. Pitchers in the sunlight, the hitters in the dark. Just missed on the inside with that one. Tried to move that one from the inside back to the play, but didn't quite make it. Two and two the count. See, the shadows have crept out in front of home plate. That curveball bounced to second, and Walker shows out Chavez. Well, I mean, it's, it's uncanny how two great sluggers on each of these ball clubs have just been so thoroughly Shortstop. shut Number down four. in this series. I asked Brady Little about his sluggers. Ramirez and Ortiz. I said, are they 
Are they pitching them so well? Is that it? Are they just making great pitches over and over again? He says, no, that's not it. I mean, they're they're making some good pitches at times. But he says they've also had pitches yet and just missed them. In addition to swinging the pitches out of the strike zone. Tejada hit a fly ball to right his first time. That curveball is hit high in the air, shallow center field. Damon. Tejada is now one for 17. Chavez 0 for 16. Ramirez 2 for 13 for Boston. Ortiz 0 for 14. Number 10. So two men are gone, and here is Scott Hatterberg. We're at Fenway Park, game four of the division series. The Oakland Athletics have jumped ahead with a 1-0 lead, getting a run in the second, although even in so doing, they let a great opportunity go by. As they had the base load with nobody out and a run home, and they got nobody else home. Meanwhile, Tim Hudson then went back to start the last of the second and had to leave the game before throwing a pitch in the second inning with the knuckleballer. Steve Sparks coming on in relief. The report from the Oakland clubhouse, by the way, on Hudson is that he suffered a left oblique strain. Hatterberg with a check swing. The ball glances foul off the bat. A ball and two strikes. Well, the oblique muscle strain is something that's common with hitters because you're swinging a bat and you rotate and you swing and miss. Sometimes you pull that muscle. It's in the upper part of the ribs and your side there. And uh, most hitters who have played this game have had it one time or another because it, it's just something that happens. It could take a while to get over that yes, too, right? It does, but I'm not sure, you know, how severely it's strained. That's the question. Strike three called on the outside. Backdoored him with the slider and got the call. The first perfect inning for Burkett. One to nothing, Oakland, last of the third. Nothing, last of the third from Fenway Park. The wind is... Uh, Accelerated blowing straight out toward right field as Bill Miller, American League batting champion, takes a strike. The flag out in center is kind of wrapped around the pole right now. But it is uh, the other flags around Fenway, you can see it uh, indicating the wind's blowing straight out toward right. John, it's not very often that you have a league batting champion hitting eighth. There's Kurt Gowdy. The Red Sox want to talk about cowboying up, and there's the cowboy behind the mic, Kurt Gowdy. I don't think I've ever seen a batting champion in any league hit eighth in a lineup. Even with the DH. I don't think I've ever seen that. Well, it's interesting because uh, they had a third baseman, Shea Hellenbrand, whom they traded to Arizona because they, they needed bullpen help. They got Byung Hyun Kim in that deal. Miller fouls one. One ball and two strikes. But that trade allowed Miller to start playing regularly at third base. It allowed Kevin Millar to become more of a full-time first baseman, which allowed David Ortiz to become more like the first, the full-time DH. And of course, all of those guys really did well for the Red Sox. Miller won the batting title. Millar drove in 96 runs, and David Ortiz suddenly got into the the MVP discussion. Two and two to Bill Miller. And that's low. The knuckleball from Sparks in his first postseason game. 38 years old. A journeyman spent most of this season in last place with a team that eventually lost 119 games. And that one misses. And Miller ends up getting a walk to start the inning. There's Theo Epstein, the Boston. Actually, his uh, former title, the senior vice president and general manager. Number 33. You know, Mason it was an odd uh, scenario, but the Oakland general manager, Billy Bean, actually was hired by the Red Sox for a brief time. And Theo Epstein worked for Billy Bean for about a day last year before Billy Bean decided, you know, I really don't want to come here. I want to stay with Oakland. They asked uh, Theo, by the way, they said, well, what was it like working for Billy Bean for just a day? He says, he's a slave driver. <laughs> Here now is Jason Veritek. And back to the bag is Miller. Miller, by the way, only two hits in 14 at-bats in the series, but he got a walk here. 
Baracek three hits and eight at bats. Big strong switch hitter. And that is ball one. Sparks was used as a reliever all this year by both Detroit and Oakland. Although he'd been a starter most of the rest of his career. He worked two innings or more in half of his games this season. He worked as many as seven and two thirds innings in a game. I mean, he's a knuckleballer. He could probably go the next 15 if they went that far. One ball and no strikes. To Baratak. Miller at first. Damon is on deck. Right up the middle. Tejada gets to it. They get the out there. The bear had a grab by Ellis to throw to first. It gets by the first baseman. And Hatterberg had no idea where the ball was. Baracek is going to go all the way to third as the catcher Mel Hughes throws to third where nobody is except the pitcher Sparks who was backing up the play. Chavez had raced in to cover home. The catcher Mel Hughes was down the right field line to pick that ball up. Hatterberg had no clue where that ball was. The ball ended up being kicked by Baracek. And it all started with a great play from the Miguel Tejada. Well, you always make sure one, and that's what they do. They get the one. But you can see as Ellis turns, Miller runs into him, and the ball actually went between the legs of Hatteberg and then was kicked by Veritek. And you see the hustle by Mel Hughes to get down there. He was going to back up first base, and he just continued on down the third. He comes up throwing the third, but there you see, and there's Guillen coming in the background, and as you see Sparks there. So you have to give Bill Miller credit for that, because he took the legs from under Mark Ellis as he turned around. Well, meanwhile, Hatterberg seemed like he was getting into it with Dallas Williams the first base coach the ball is rolling down the right field line and Hatterberg it was almost like he thought that Dallas Williams somehow was hiding the ball from him. the athletics bring the infield in here for Damon so they got the four side at second then an error charge to Mark Ellis the bear check ending up at third that one is hit well in the right center field die looking back it is into the bullpen a two run homer for Johnny Damon. And the Red Sox have gone ahead. power in this Boston batting order it is Johnny Damon the leadoff man who hits the home run to put them ahead two to one he got it up into that wind blowing out to right and hit it out with plenty to spare as Garcia Parra comes up now with a count of one ball and one strike and the ball carries so much better here in the daytime as it does in most ballparks and that was pretty much a line drive it's a foul back out of play so finally the Red Sox get a hit with the runner in scoring position. Well, it acted more like a slider, just a little movement towards Damon, and he hit a line drive. Right out of here. And it is the fifth Boston Homer of this series. I see a power. Right center. Die. And Burns both there. Die takes it. Nomar is 0 for 2 in the game. Two down. Now you see the knuckleball. It doesn't do a lot. It just kind of tumbles toward Johnny Damon. And like I said, it was more of a line drive. I mean, you see the route fielders that gave up on it early because it was hit on a line. And it goes into the bullpen. And the Sox did what the A's couldn't do. They got a runner in from third with less than two. 
Todd Walker, the hitter. He's hit two of those Boston home runs. By the way, that home run by Damon with a runner in scoring position broke the Boston doldrums. They had been 0 for 17, 0 for their last 17 in those kind of at bats. The whole team had been struggling in those situations. Todd Walker popped up to short his first time. One ball and two strikes. Two to one, Boston ahead. Two and two. Looks like Johnny Damon was exercising some muscle memory there or something. <laughs> and he was still feeling the grip and the stroke. Two and two. The shortstop, Tejada. And that ends the inning. Another Oakland error. And then a clutch Boston hit. Two to one Red Sox after three. Boston Harbor in the distance. And we're in the, the back bay of Fenway Park in the Fens as Jose Guillen takes ball one from John Burkett. Burkett coming off his first three up, three down inning. But he curves for ball two there in the dirt outside. Guillen got a base hit in the second inning. When Oakland uh, ended up scoring its only run of this game. But also, the inning in which they got that run ended up being an inning of lost opportunities. They had the bases loaded and nobody out with the run already in, and they couldn't get anybody else home. That curveball fouled. But I think, Joe, you've been, you've been pointing out with that wall looming so close in left field to get that off-speed pitch. Why not take a shot at well, it? Well, that's what we saw him do right there. It seems that, you know, Oakland's approach has been, you know, to try to go the other way off of Burkett. That is through the middle. Base hit. He got a fastball and he ripped it over the middle. So Guillen is two for two. Hit number five for the Athletics. Our views from high above Fenway Park catcher, have been the courtesy of the Hood Light Shift. H.P. Hood supports children's hospitals throughout New England in partnership with the Boston Red Sox. And we are extremely pleased to have them with us today as part of our coverage of Game 4 of this American League Division Series. The winner of this series will face the winner of the Yankees-Minnesota Series. The Yankees are hoping to win that series today at the Metrodome, back of David Wells. That's... Off the outside ball, one to Adam Melhews, who hit a single his first time. Melhews looked like a pretty good hitter. He's got his approach. I mean, he stays right there. He goes, you know, he doesn't pull off. He looks like he's a pretty good hitter. Started the year in AAA, playing for Sacramento. Called up in late May. And that's a strike on the inside. And it's also an opportunity for Melhews. The guy's been around for a long time. He's 31 years old. He's been with the Dodgers, the Rockies, now Oakland. But this is his first postseason game, and he got a base hit in his first postseason at bat. In the second inning, he wasn't originally in the lineup, but Ramon Hernandez, with a strained lower back, had to be scratched from the lineup today. Yeah, and the runner at first. And he's uh, got some extra. Well, that's protection for that uh, that wrist. Eric. Yeah, but I, I think most of the players use those now. They're sliding mechanisms that keep you from hurting your hand when you slide, and obviously his is already hurt, so it protects him against that as well. But a lot of hitters, a lot of base runners actually wear those gloves and stuff now. Because most people, it's when you slide, you put your hand down, and that protects it. That's a base hit. Mel Hughes is two for two. Damon picks it up, breaking for third. Guillen, the throw! Out! A perfect throw by Johnny Damon on a hop! Wow! I tell you, I, I thought Guillen had made the right choice. I mean, force him to throw you out, and Damon makes a perfect throw. I mean, it's right on top of the bag. If the ball's left or right a foot, he's safe. So I, I think that was good. Hustle, I think, was a good chance to take, and Mel Hughes did a great job of moving down to second base. 
I think you have to try to make some things happen here a few days. And I think Gian made a, a you know he made a good choice. Damon just made a better play. I mean that was some big league ball right there. Yeah, this is playoff baseball, and that's what you want. See, look at he never slows down. He says, I'm gonna go. Now watch where this throw is and just realize if it's not directly over the bag, he's not gonna be out. And that ball was directly at the bag. I mean, and you figure a guy can't throw a ball from 300 feet right on top of the bag. Look at that. Look where the throw is. Wow. And it, if it is any place else, he's safe. Great call by yeah. Ed Montague, the crew chief, the third base umpire. It was a good tag by Miller. He, he dropped it down on him very quickly. Didn't look that way in slow motion, but he did. So the Athletics, with one out, have a runner at second. Mel Hughes went to second on the throw to third. Jermaine Dye, who drove in Oakland's run with the base hit in the second, and he tried to do it again here. Two to one, Boston is leading. Oakland in this game has six hits in these first three and a third innings, plus a walk. They've had lots of base runners, but just the one run. Just off the outside. Two and one. Boston has only two hits in the game. But two runs. Johnny Damon, who hit the two-run homer in the third. And he follows it up. A little uh, encore with just a perfect throw. I mean, they would have had runners at second and third. No one and out. nobody out. I mean, that is just huge. Yeah. I mean, again, that ball is, I mean, it's right on the bag. I mean, if the ball's a foot either way. I mean, it's it's he's safe. I mean, they might do that play 50 more times, right. and that might be the only time you get it. Exactly. Three and one, the count to die. That curveball, a little looping liner, and caught by the diving Walker. So a little defensive retribution for Walker, who had some real problems that cost the Red Sox badly in Oakland on defense. Well, he wanted to catch it in there because if you let that ball hit the ground with all the spin it had on it, there's no telling where it would have bounced. Now watch, you see him come get it because he doesn't want that ball to hit the ground. Walker with the uh, the microphone and a curveball. One ball, no strikes. That ball. Trapped by the catcher, Jason Veritek. Eric Burns, the hitter. He popped up to second with the bases loaded and nobody out in the second inning. Sometimes it's not how many hits you get, it's when you get it. Burns had three hits last night, but the play we, we all remember is that he forgot to touch home plate. Ball, no strikes. That is Mel Hughes, the catcher, at second. Two down. Two to one. The Red Sox are leading. John Burkett. One time 20 game winner with the Giants 10 years ago. Curveball. That floats through there. Tantalizingly for the strike. One and one. Burkett's never been quite as good again as he was back in 93 with the Giants. A big slow curveball. It stayed on the inside part of the plate, but it was a, it fooled him because it was so slow. That one to Miller, and that's the inning. The Athletics cannot get that big hit. Manny Ramirez coming up. Are leading the Athletics two to one. The Red Sox in another must-win situation. If they don't win, they have to go home. The Boston Bruins are just getting ready to start their season. That's the captain of the Boston Bruins, Joe Thornton, and many of the Bruins are here today to watch the Red Sox. They will start the NHL season on Wednesday. The Bees. As they sometimes call them here in Boston, the Boston Bruins. We'll get the NHL season started, and uh, ESPN will be covering the NHL. Here is Manny Ramirez. In deep third. Chavez, the long throw. Gets Ramirez. Chavez is good. I mean, he has showed us that he can really play third base. And he makes everything look easy. All the plays he had last night, there were some difficult ones, backhands and whatever, but he makes it look so easy, so smooth over there at third base. 
I mean, watch it. I've always talked about good feet. Now, watch how he backs up, but he gets himself in position right away to get rid of the ball. You know, you've got to have quick feet to play the infield, and he does a good job. I mean, he's just so smooth at third. Here's David Ortiz. He's 0 for 14 in this series. That knuckler floats outside. One ball, no strikes. Ortiz grounded out the second, in the second. Jim Hudson had to leave this game after one inning pitch with a left oblique muscle strain. He really thought about taking a shot at that one to Ortiz. Then at the last, he thought better of it. 2-0. It was too far inside. Kevin Millar on deck. 2-1 Boston. Shadows are about halfway between the home plate and the mound now. But it swung at that one and it disappeared. You see how they've cut right across the area between home plate and the mound. It's not quite that dark when you're standing there, but it is definitely a, a transition from light to dark, darker. Two and one. And back to the screen. Two balls, two strikes. Take a look at this knuckleball and it's a little slower, so you get a chance to see it. Now watch it start right there. It starts to get dark. That's coming into the shadows. Two and two. And a full count. Sparks the emergency replacement. I asked Ken Mocker before the game, the Oakland manager, who would be the first reliever in. And he said, you know, we don't, we don't really look at it as a long reliever for Hudson today. And we'll just mix and match as we go through. And down goes Ortiz. Now you can see Sparks. He doesn't throw anything but the knuckleball. He says, I'm going to either walk here or make you put it in play, but I'm not going to change and go to a fastball or a slider. First baseman, number 15, Kevin. So now Kevin Miller coming up. Fenway Park. The Oakland Athletics and the Boston Red Sox in this division series. Oakland leading two games to one. Ace right handed Tim Hudson had to leave the game with a left oblique strain after just one inning. The emergency replacement, the knuckleball of the veteran Steve Sparks in Boston on the Johnny Damon home run in the third, holding a two to one lead here. John Burkett has pitched the first four innings for the Red Sox, allowing just the one run. Kevin Millar, the hitter, batting with two down and nobody on. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. What a week this has been, Joe. Yeah. I mean, we're living a baseball dream. I mean, we started off at Yankee Stadium on Tuesday. We've been to. Turner Field, we've been to the Oakland Coliseum, Wrigley Field, Fenway. In fact, we really lived the baseball dream going Wrigley one night and Fenway the next. Millar chasing that one. We didn't get it. That one clocked at 61 miles an hour. And John, on top of that, we've seen some great ball games. I mean, we saw a great game in Wrigley Field, Mark Pyre pitched. We saw a great game in New York. I mean, we've seen some well played ball games, and then we see some where it wasn't so well played defensively, but all in all, they've been very good ball games. And that's outside for a ball. I mean, we saw Barry Zito Thursday just pitch a fabulous game for the Athletics against this great hitting Red Sox team. The very next night, Mark Pryor, the uh, the young Turk of the Chicago Cubs, shut down the best hitting National League team at Wrigley Field with a two hitter. Three and two now to Millar. Trot Nixon would be next, the left handed hitter. And the walk. Second walk allowed. More division series action coming up today. I don't know if we can get to Minnesota in time, Joe. Maybe we have to let somebody else do that. <laughs> I guess we can't do them all. The Yankees and the Twins, game four. Yanks trying to clinch it. David Wells against Johan Santana. Four Eastern, three Central on ESPN. Then tonight, the Cubs and Braves. One team will advance, the other goes home. It's the deciding game five. Kerry Wood for the Cubs. Mike Hampton for Atlanta on three days rest from Turner Field, 7.30 Eastern, 6.30 Central. Gary Thorne, David Justice, and Jeff Bradley will be at the Metrodome, by the way, following us for the Yankees and the Twins. Trot Nixon lined hard, but to the first baseman his first time. Nixon had that big home run last night. Out of North Carolina State. Gary Miller interviewed him right after the ball game and all the excitement and uh, 
if you were with us you saw that the trot is a, a very religious man and uh, so he didn't want to take any of the glory for himself but all, and also very humble because uh, Gary Miller mentioned hey you did something the last one to do it was Kirk Gibson in the World Series in 88 and in the postseason game like that in dramatic fashion in a, such a way and and Trot said well you know that was a World Series I think that's a little bigger than what I did <laughs> I don't think the Boston fans think so I, I thought they thought this was much yeah. bigger yeah <laughs> Both happened against Oakland, ironically. That's too long. So now it's 3 0 to Nixon. Bill Miller is on deck. One of the problems you have when you have to talk about knuckleball pitchers is they can go along, retiring everyone to run, all of a sudden they can't throw a strike with the knuckleball. It just dances out of the strike zone. Well, it is not dancing favorably for Sparks right now. He's walked two in a row. Rick Peterson placing a call to the Oakland bullpen. So while they talk it over at the mound, here's Gary Miller. John, two different mentalities on this team starting to relive history. The A's have had leads before in series and not been able to put teams away. And the Red Sox, as soon as they lost game two, in their clubhouse, Lou Merloni, one of seven Red Sox who were on that team in 99, that was did a 2 nothing hold at Cleveland, said they immediately started talking about that. So you don't want to give this team life. If you give us life, watch out. Well, they got life last night, and that's the way these two teams seem to be playing mentally. The Red Sox smell blood, and the A's are playing defensively. All right, good point. It is uh, Chad Harville is up in the Oakland bullpen now, and Rick Peterson, the pitching coach, has gone out to the mound to talk to Sparks, who's got some big pitches to make now to Bill Miller with two men on and two men out here in the fourth inning. And then from high overhead, the Oakland bullpen there with Harville working, and those uh, pictures from high overhead have been courtesy of the Hood Lightship. HP Hood supports children's hospitals throughout New England in partnership with the Boston Red Sox. Welcome to our telecast. Here's Bill Miller. And that is too high. Grady Little pointed out Bill Miller especially because he's a contact type hitter. He hit for some power this year but really a contact hitter all the way. And Grady said you know last night especially Bill was swinging the pitches that he ordinarily hits hard and missing them. He does not often swing and miss. That is high. Two and up. Miller walked his first time against Sparks back in the third inning. And Sparks has missed the strike zone with nine consecutive pitches now. That's a called strike. Bouncing off the glove of Mel Hughes. Two and one the count. Terry Francona in the foreground. There's manager Ken Maka. Francona, the bench coach. Millar at second. Nixon at first. Bill Miller trying to deliver a run. Boston already ahead two to one. And it's not going into the strike zone right now. Three and one the count. There's always a theory, you know, about knuckleball pitchers. So if you stay close to them, they will help you out. Then you just have to get that one big hit. Now the Fenway crowd gets into it. And that is right to the second baseman, Ellis. Trent Nixon tried to uh, obstruct Ellis's view of that one while he could, but it did not work. Don't use the word obstruction. <laughs> At my own peril. Yeah. <laughs> playing the Red Sox in A's game. Playing the Oakland half of the fourth where Jose Guillen got thrown out at third. You always hear, don't make the first or third out at, or at third base. We thought it was a good aggressive play, just like Joe Morgan did. Yeah, well, there's sometimes you got to force the action. And you know what happened there, though, is Johnny Damon made a perfect throw. The teams in this playoffs that made the plays defensively have won. He made a perfect throw. Oakland threw a ball away. It allowed Damon to have a runner at third base. Hits a home run. Next thing you know, it's... It's a two-run pitch. They, you got a ball to drive out. You know, we've got more baseball coming up. Game four between the Yankees and Twins. We're still playing in Boston. We'll start that on ESPN2, John. All right, and here we go to the Oakland half of the fifth inning. Lead-off man Mark Ellis trying to get him started here. He's 0 for 2 in the game and 2 for 12 in the series. John Burkett misses. Ball two. Burkett working into the fifth inning. And he's given the Red Sox so far just what they needed today. 
They're only keeping them in the game. He's got the lead, but he is suddenly behind Ellis 3 0. Got some power coming up next. Uh, Rubiel Durazo on deck, then Eric Chavez and Miguel Tejada. Three power hitters. That's a strike. Three and one. Well, I think in this case, you're three and one. If you're Ellis, you either take a shot at the right left field wall or just go ahead and take another strike, take another pitch. And that sinker down and in for ball four. So Ellis gets the walk to start it off. Well, they're talking about that throw by Johnny Damon in the fourth inning after Guillen had singled. Mel Hughes had a single. And Guillen took off for third. And again, it was a good hustle play. I thought he did the right thing. Damon comes up. Now watch this throw. I mean, it's right over the bag. I mean, if the ball is over here, over there, I mean, he's safe. And I mean, he still was only out by about three inches. I mean, it was just a very close play at third. But as Harold said, the teams that are making the defense the plays have been the ones that have won the series. But I've been saying that all year that defense is now far more important than it's ever been. Now here is uh, Rubio Durazo. You saw Guillen there in the dugout. And it looks like he might be icing that. Uh, well, he's actually heating it, John. That, uh, what happens is you ice it before the game. Once you start the game, you want to try to keep it hot. And what they were doing, uh, Tejada gave him one of those heat, little heat wrap pads, and he put it on there, and then he wrapped his towel around it. I could see it in between innings. You didn't get a chance to see that, but that's what he's doing. Is trying to keep it warm. If you if you keep it warm, yeah. See, if you keep it warm there, if you keep your keep your hand warm during the game, that's what you want to do. Keep it warm. Well, you saw it, and I didn't see it. Where was I? <laughs> I mean, I was sitting right here next to you, wasn't I? Yeah, but I was watching it. <laughs> And that's a ball up and away. So Burkett is not throwing strikes here. Well, neither was Sparks at the end of the last inning. So, I mean, you could think, well, maybe they're running out of gas. Jim Wakefield up in the bullpen now. Burkett has thrown 86 pitches in only four plus innings. That is a strike. Durazo has singled and he has popped out to third. He popped out to third for the final out of that second inning when they had. The base is loaded. Burkett made a great pitch, jammed him. He got out of the uh, difficulty in the second with only one run scoring. They had the base loaded, nobody out after the run scored and couldn't get anybody else home. That one hit sharply, knocked down by Malone. And he'll race to first, just in time. Durazo went in with a slide, as did Malone. Well, I think if you're Durazo, you still have to run through the bag. Because anytime you're sliding, you have to bend your knee a little bit. You can't go in straight leg because you'll break your leg. So you have to bend it a little bit. Therefore, you're not getting there any as quick as you possibly can. I mean, this is a nice play by Malaga. This ball was nailed. He got a pretty good hop there. And now watch this. If you run through the bag, see when you slide, you have to bend your knee. So therefore, you don't get there as quick as you possibly can. But it's a good play there by Malari. He gets back now. It's up to him. It's a good job for him to slide. See his leg is straight. And watch his. You have to bend it in order to keep from breaking your leg. So, a spectacular save there by Millar and what otherwise would have been a base hit to right, and they'd have runners at first and third. Nobody out right now with Chavez up and Tejada on deck. Well, Ch Chavez is going to have to give them something if they're going to win either this game or the next one. I mean, the reason I mean, he's hitting third in the order. You can't have a guy right in the middle of your order, you know, and he doesn't give you anything. And Chavez is one of their better players. So you have to have something from your better players in the playoffs to get the job done. Let's see. Uh, Durazo kind of limped off the field there. After this slide at first. And there is ball three to Chavez, who has flied out to left center, grounded out to second. 0 for 2 in the game. And he's old for the series. This may be a time. I mean, if you're Ken Mocker, you say, go ahead and take a shot. You haven't been swinging the bat well. Sit on this fastball and hurt him. And there it is, right there in the middle of the plate. And he, and he took it. He looked at it. Three and one. See, there are some times when a walk's not going to really do you any good. If you take, if you walk right there, what are you really accomplishing? You're not moving any runners. But if you've got a three and zero count, you have one of your sluggers, home run hitters up there, and a the guy's going to groove one. Why not let him take a shot at it? Veracek, he's got room. So 
So he took the 3 0 pitch and then fouled out on the next pitch. Well, in theory, he got pretty much the same pitch. He got another fastball and he just didn't do anything with it. You know, when you're swinging a bat poorly, I mean, that's just what happens. See, that's a good pitch to hit. I mean, you know, if you're ahead in the count, you're looking fastball, you get the pitch right there. I mean, it's up to you to hit it. You just missed it. And look, when you're in a slump and you're not swinging a bat well, you know, you do things like that. If you're swinging a bat well, they can throw your pitch down and away and you still drive it someplace. So that's the anatomy of a slump. When you're not swinging well and you're getting pitches to hit. That's Burkett and the catcher Veritek talking it over at the mound. The plate umpire Jerry Davis goes out to uh, hurry them along. <laughs> they say, okay. <laughs> Davis turned around to go back and then Veritek says, oh, one other thing. Shortstop, number four. All right, so now they're going to uh, go ahead and, uh, and play ball again. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. We're at Fenway Park. It is two to one. The Red Sox leading the athletics here on a beautiful, sensationally beautiful autumn day. Those long October shadows lengthening out toward the pitcher's mound now as Tejada takes the ball. Tejada had a lot of success in the past against John Burkett. 345 lifetime average against him coming into this one. Oakland hitting only 180 as a team in this series, though. And what's worse, they haven't even hit a home run yet, which is their favorite weapon. Their uh, first two men up with Menace Grimm just got hits none since. That's a strike on the outside. They've had two hits in eight at bats total today. And these kinds of uh, clutch at bats. Well, the one thing that Burke has been able to do, he's thrown such a variety of speeds that when he does turn the fastball loose, even though it's only 84, or so it looks like it's in the high 90s because of the, the various the speeds that he's thrown. There's Millar again from his knees. Burkett covering out and the inning is over. So Burkett has given the Red Sox five strong innings with the lead. Veritek coming up then that man. The Red Sox two the Athletics one. Jason Veritek hitting ninth in the order. You mentioned they had a batting champion here in the game. How about a catcher with 25 homers and 85 batted in batting ninth. And there's ball one from Steve Sparks the knuckleballer. Into his fourth inning of work in relief of Hudson, who had to leave the game with an injury after one inning. A strained left oblique. That is a called strike. One ball, one strike. Veritek hit the uh, four side. It started out as a great play by Miguel Tejada, preventing a base hit. But it ended up with Veritek at third base after Ellis made a low throw to first and it was kicked by Veritek down the right field line and by the time it was recovered he was at third. That was moments before Damon's home run put Boston ahead. Jermaine Dye said I've got this one in right center. One down. The A's had a run home and the bases loaded in the second but could not get anybody else home. Garasso made the final out to leave them loaded. So they had just the one run then. Hudson went out to warm up for the bottom half of the inning and was hurt. He had to leave the game. That's when they discovered this strained oblique muscle. Then Johnny Damon hits the two run homer in the third and suddenly Boston was leading. And here is Damon in the fifth inning. Damon not only hit that home run the very next half inning the top of the fourth. He made the perfect throw from center field to nail Guillen at third when Anything but a perfect throw would have seen the A's with runners at second and third and nobody out in that inning. Red Sox uh, have been very crisp defensively all day today. That knuckler too high. Two and one. The Athletics in these last four postseasons seven times played a ball game where if they won they would have clinched the series. And they've lost all seven of them. One three years ago, three in a row, two years ago to the Yankees. The last two last year to the Twins and last night's ball game here. Yeah, but the one thing they know, I mean, even though they may lose today or if, if they're not able to clinch it today, they still have one more shot. And then Barry Zito scheduled for tomorrow, but on three days of rest. Hatterberg 
Sparks covering, and Damon is retired. Two men down. And I'm no mark coming up. Ken Mocker, first year Oakland manager. No mark. Who also could have ended up managing the Red Sox. Red Sox were a team that asked for permission to talk to uh, Maka a couple of years back. And Billy Bean said, no, absolutely not. He's too important to us. Tim Hudson had only pitched one other game on three days of rest, and that was last year in game four against Minnesota, a game in which he did not pitch very long. On one to Nomar. Barry Zito has never pitched a game on three days of rest. Well, I think what you're, you're, what Ken Maka came to the conclusion is, of is that the fact that if you're going to beat me, you have to beat both of my guys. Instead of maybe saving Hudson or you know for you know tomorrow and having you know full rest, then you wouldn't be able to use Zito. So I guess he's saying you got to beat both of my guys, whether they're on three days rest or not. Omar pops it up, coming down to help out Hatterberg, and he takes it. That was as opposed to the play last night where Chavez did not help out the catcher. Now to the sixth inning, Hatterberg coming up, Jory Hunter at the Metrodome. As the Twins and Yankees are getting ready to play there. And that'll be coming up on ESPN at 4 Eastern, 3 Central Time. The Twins in desperate straits. They must win today to keep their season going. Johan Santana will be on the mound against David Wells there. Now John Burkett back for the sixth inning. The bullpen will be ready for the Red Sox. They're already working out there. As uh, Scott Hatterberg is at the plate. Back. It was deflected by Burkett. Barehanded by Nomar, no play. And it is an infield hit for Hatterberg. Second time he's been on base today. Well, Hatterberg drives this ball right back through the middle. Burkett gets a little lather on it, slows it down, and Nomar can't make the play. It's just a little bit of leather right there. Hits him in the fingers and rolls in front of Nomar. I mean, talk about frustration for the athletics today. This is the fourth inning in which they've gotten their leadoff man on base. Four out of six innings, the first guy has reached base. But they've only been able to score the one run. In each of the last three innings, the first batter up has reached base, including Guillen, who's up right now. When he's single, leading off the fourth inning. There were extenuating circumstances in that inning, of course, because Guillen ended up being thrown out at third on Mel Hughes' base hit on the perfect thre throw by Johnny Damon. That slider popped up foul and back onto the rooftop. Well, Guillen is having some good swings at Burkett the entire ball game. Guillen hit 31 homers with 86 runs batted in this year. In 136 games, splitting time between the Cincinnati Reds in the National League and the Athletics. Hit 311 for batting average. Burke has thrown over 100 pitches in this one. Wakefield, the knuckleballer, up in the bullpen. That is caught! A diving catch by Miller at third! Well, that's how you win close ball games. You make all the plays. We saw Damon throw. Gian out now you see Miller rob him of a base hit if he'd hit that same ball before two strikes it would have been a base hit because Miller was playing in closer but see he's back now plus he's way off the line I mean that ball's lined sharply toward left field and they were giving Gian all the line and Miller comes up with it but good heads up base running by Hattieberg he doesn't get double off so now here's Adam Melhews who's had two base hits and his first two postseason at bats. The curveball off the outside. He's playing in place of Ramon Hernandez, who has a strained lower back and had to be scratched from the lineup. Well, that's two innings in a row where the leadoff man has gotten on base for Oakland. And then the next batter hit a shot that was turned into a brilliant defensive play by the Red Sox. That curve in the dirt that he swing? No. Third base umpire, Ed Montague, made the ruling. 2 0 the count. Durazo hit a shot headed for right field that Millar made a dive for and, and knocked down and turned it into an out. Now Miller with the spectacular diving catch of that liner by Guillen. Both of those innings could have looked so much different if the Red Sox had not made those two plays. 
That one is hit down the right field line. Nixon going back. And it's over his head. He's out in the sun field. And he could not get it. Heading home is Hatterberg. Here comes the throw, and it's too late. Hatterberg scores. And all the way to third goes Mel Hughes. Adam Mel Hughes, in his postseason debut, is three for three. And the score is tied. Well, I mentioned earlier in the game that I thought Nixon was a little gimpy out there, and we see how he played. Uh, he starts back on this ball, and, and he's just he's not 100%. I mean, he's got a sore calf muscle, and he's not able to run this ball down. And he gives it a great try, but the ball is just over his head. I mean, you, when you can't run full speed, you just can't get back there. And the ball was hit pretty well. He barely misses it, though. So Oakland gets the break. It's tied at two. Now a runner at third with one out. The infield is in for Jermaine Dye, who drove in their other run with a single back in the second. He takes a strike. I told you earlier, I just, you know, you watch Mel Hughes. I mean, his approach is so good. I, I You can see why he was such a good hitter in AAA. And he's going to be a good hitter in the big leagues. Jermaine Dye, one for two. Fastball inside. Dye, we're talking about these uh, fine defensive plays made by Boston. Die hit a little soft bloop that was turned into a beautiful catch, a little kind of a squib that was turned into a diving catch by Todd Walker his last time. That curve is hit toward the wall. High and deep and way out of here. I'll say it again. That's the guy you want up there. He's been an RBI man and he knows what he's supposed to do in those situations. Jermaine Die with a long home run. And it is. 4 to 2 Oakland. Die has driven in three of those four runs. When you've been an RBI man and you get in those situations, you know what the pitcher's trying to do to you. He took two fastballs then and then he waited for the curveball because he knows that's what he's been trying to get him out with all day. So what do you do? You sit on the curveball and then you get it and you take advantage of that wall out there in left field. And that's what he does curveball and it's gone it's immediately as soon as he hits it. That's just good hitting by Jermaine Dye knowing what the guy is going to try to do to you and taking advantage of it. Right to the back of the monster seats out there almost out on the Lansdowne Street. That's going to be all for Burkett and Oakland is back ahead four to two in the sixth. Home run by Jermaine Dye after a regular season Harold that basically was a wash didn't even hit 200. Well you saw the same thing with Edgardo Alfonso from San Francisco and then Jermaine has an opportunity here. What's interesting to me is situational hitting. Johnny Dam with the run at third base looking to get something in the air drives out of the ballpark and Jermaine Dye run on third same thing. And these are the moments that people remember from this point forward. We've got more coming from Fenway right now guys. All right, then the here is Eric Burns against Tim Wakefield, the knuckle uh, baller on for the Red Sox. Now we've got two knuckle ballers in the game. Sparks for Oakland. Burns has popped a second and grounded out to, th to third. He's 0 for 2. That one in there for a called strike. One ball, one strike. Now, in this inning, I mean, John Burkett, after giving up the leadoff hit, and Guillen hit a shot to third that Miller turned into a diving catch. That one is out into center field. It's a base hit for Burns. The fourth hit of the inning. But there'll be a lot of questions asked after this game about Grady Little staying with John Burkett so long after he'd already given him five strong Second innings. Baseman, I think it tells you something about Mark his feeling about the bullpen. Ellis. You know, last night he used Timlin. He got some great work. They were four, they four shutout innings. In fact, they didn't even allow a base runner. And you and he's trying to get where he doesn't have to use those guys again. And I think that's what he was doing because you got what you wanted out of Burke at five strong innings. I mean, with the lead. I mean, what else? If you'd, have, if, if you couldn't have asked for more than that at the beginning of this ball game. Mark Ellis, the leadoff man, has flied out to left center, fouled out to the catcher, and walked. And Mel Hughes hit the uh, shot to right that uh, Trot Nixon couldn't quite get back to handle. Also battling the sun. I mean, right field when the sun is shining is a, a vicious sun field in this ballpark. And then Die hit the uh, the booming home run. So each of the last three hitters of the inning just hit shots. In fact, the first hit of the inning, Hatterberg's base hit on the infield was a liner headed for the middle that Burkett deflected with his glove. 
Well, they had to go through the signs again that tells they had wanted to put something on, and Ellis wasn't watching. They started all over again. Ron Washington, the third base coach. Wakefield. And that's low and outside. Now, it's Sunday. On Thursday, Wakefield was the starting pitcher at the Oakland Coliseum in a ball game that Oakland won. Wakefield went six innings in that ball game. So was testing the idea that knuckleballers just can have an endless reserve of, <laughs> of pitches that they can throw. There goes the runner. And it's a double play. A liner right to Millar for an inning ending double play. So Ellis hit the ball to the right side but into a double play. But Jermaine Dye with a long two run homer has put Oakland ahead. Those views courtesy of the Hood Lightship. HP Hood supports children's hospitals throughout New England in partnership with the Boston Red Sox. Here's Todd Walker, Ricardo Rincon in from the Oakland bullpen, and this is a rematch of these two lefties from game one. Rincon, who gave up a two-run homer to Walker in the seventh inning of game one that for a while had the Red Sox leading in that one. Rincon for the year. Oakland will try to get the final four innings out of its bullpen here. Now leading four to two. It's a strength in the outside. But 20, 25 years ago, they had the the one game playoff to determine who was going into the postseason from the American League East between the Yankees and the Red Sox right here. The game in which Bucky Dent hit a three run homer with Boston leading two to one. And they put them ahead four to two and they won that game. And it's going outside. Two balls and a strike. And forever after, Bucky Dent here in New England has been known as, uh, I'm going to put it this way, Bucky Bleeping Dent. How about Jermaine Bleeping Die? Well, there's Pedro hoping that he'll get the start tomorrow. Manny Ramirez on deck as Walker leads off. And that's too high. Three and one. The Red Sox would like them out of comeback before it got down to uh, Key Folk. Well, I think the key here is if you're the A's, you want, you're going to try to get two innings out of Folk if you can, if you can get the lead. You expect him to pitch the eighth and the ninth, but you've got to get there first. So they've got Rincon, they've got Bradford, the two guys they like to use in front of Folk in the late innings. Three and one to Walker. That's a strength on the outside. Walker is 0 for 2 in the game, has popped a short and grounded a short. In that big first game, four hits, five at bats, two homers, one against Rincon, but he has not had a hit since. Four to two, Oakland leading, last of the sixth. Going back is Jermaine Dye, still going back, and that ball is gone! Todd Walker has hit another home run against Rincon. So just like that, Boston gets one of them back. Four to three, Oakland. Now well, the ball is really carrying well in that area. That's where Damon hit his ball. When he first hit it, I thought it might be in the gap, but it just kept going and going. So now Ramirez, the right-handed power hitter, against the left-hander, Rincon. Ramirez's bat has been slumbering in this series. He has a hit today, one for two. Ramirez has only faced Rincon one other time. Too far in. And you see immediately that's the way they've been pitching Manning the entire series off the plate inside and he has helped him out on numerous occasions by swinging at the pitch off the plate inside. Time taken now. Ramirez backs away. And usually when Ramirez is coming up they either get Rincon out of there or they 
They wait until Manny has finished his at bat before they bring Rincon in. The middle hitters in the order have not produced in this series. That's a called strike, and Manny complains about that one to Jerry Davis. He thought it was too low. There's Manny, though nothing seems to bother him. Well, according to Kazon, he just got the corner and knee high. A ball and a strike. The big wall in left looming large. High in the air to center, but this one's not going to go. Eric Burns, plenty of room out there. One away. Well, it was three balls, two strikes. You're trying to throw a strike, and that's what he does. He throws it pretty much in the middle of the plate. About belt high, and Jermaine Dye runs out of room in right field. But I mean, that's what you're supposed to do. You have a two run lead. You do not want to walk the leadoff hitter with Manny Ramirez and the other power coming up. So you make Walker swing the bat, and he does a good job of driving it. Not David Ortiz. 0 for 2 in the game. Jesus is now 0 for 15. And he has really struggled, but most of it again has been because he's chasing pitches out of the strike zone. And Ortiz has never done well against Rincon. And one hit in 12 career at-bats for him against Rincon. Well, not nobody on. The Red Sox down by a run. And slider in the dirt. One ball, one strike. Well, the Red Sox had a couple of down the stretch magical comebacks here in Fenway Park, so I'm sure they never think the game's over as long as they have some outs remaining. And so Walker hit that home run to put them ahead in game one of this series, the other night against Green Cone. He also had a three run game tying two out homer in the ninth inning of the game they, they clinched in the playoff berth a week ago last Thursday. One and two now to Ortiz. I mean, this Red Sox power has just been really not heard from a whole lot. They've hit some homers in this series, but the, the big offense has not been there. Manny Ramirez, who put in a call for the homer by Nixon that ended last night's game, put in one right here for Ortiz. And it's up and away. Two and two to count. Sometimes on the bench, your players will get a feeling like he's going to take him out right now, though, and they're putting a the call for him. Well, Manny's had that feeling for a few innings last night and a few today. A liner and into the glove of Don. Hit hard by Ortiz. That's one of his best hit balls in this series. He did not get under it. Two down. And now Kevin Millar will come up. Miguel Tejada, meanwhile, out to the mound, putting his arm around the shoulder of Rincon. And as they chat. Kevin Millar, powerful hitter. He's, he's hit a few over that wall this year. He's grounded out to second and walked. David Ortiz, the former twin, he still got some very close friends of that Minnesota ball club. Like Tony Hunter and Eddie Guardado. The Twins will be getting started in about 45 minutes against the Yankees. In a game they must win. Just as is the case here with Ortiz's Red Sox. As Millar hit that one off his left foot. Trot Nixon would be next. The Oakland bullpen is busy again. Four to three. Oakland on top in the last of the six. All of Boston's scoring today on two home runs. A two run shot by Damon and a solo here by Walker in the sixth. The Red Sox only have three hits in this game. The base hits have been hard to come by for both teams in this series. Strike down to Kevin Millar. Millar had 25 homers and 30 doubles during the year, with 96 runs batted in. 
There's Chad Harville, a right-hander up in the Oakland bullpen. Go to three, Oakland on top. A three-run six inning for the A's to go ahead here. Toward the wall, but that one's not hit well enough. As Guillen caught that one, it looked like he caught it right in the toward the heel of his glove there. But that is the inning. Todd Walker taking one out to make it a one-run game. The Oakland Athletics four, the Boston Red Sox three. Now the seventh inning. And Rubio Durazo takes a strike. Last night, as the game headed into the late innings, it was a tie game. This time, Boston, which must win to stay alive, is down a run. And the big hitters are coming up for Oakland here against Wakefield. Durazo bounces one to Millar, and he is gone. Durazo now one for four in the game. Chavez and Tejada still to come. This series has been so tightly played. As uh, 26 of the 38 innings played in this series, the game's either been tied or just one run has separated the teams. And uh, many of those. There's Pedro. He's hoping to get a start tomorrow where he feels like. You know, he'll have full rest and he can get the job done for the Red Sox. Chavez taking a ball. And it is 2 0. Chavez 0 for 3 in the game. Could Oakland win a series where their two top sluggers, Chavez and Tejada, both got entirely shut down? I mean, they're ahead in this series and they're ahead in this game. If they can stay ahead today, they win. Even though Chavez is 0 for 17. He's only had one walk in this series. That's the only time he's been on base. Tejada is one for 18 with no walks in the series. But they lead the series and they lead this game. Two and one on the count. That one is hit well out toward the triangle deep in the right center field. Damon is going to have to go chase it, but it bounces up over the wall for the automatic double out near that 420 foot sign. And deep right center and that is a place where you hit triples well that was looked like it was going to be a triple but it bounced into the seats you know and that kept Chavez from running short stop. he hit that ball pretty well Miguel he hits it in what they call the triangle here I mean watch this ball if it stays in it would have been a triple but it bounces up and they call the ground rule double but if it hits the fence here and bounces down I think Chavez could have had a triple out of it. And you see some weird things happen when balls bouncing around in that area. With all those angles, that's a strike to Tejada, who was 0 for 3 today. I mean, if that one had hit off that wall to the right, it could come back and hit off the center field wall. And, and sometimes you see him go start bouncing back and forth. Every once in a while, a ball getting stuck in that big doorway out there. And the pickoff throw to second. Chavez dives back in. So Chavez. With his first hit of this series. This is from the blimp on that uh, double by Chavez. The Red Sox got a break and it bounced out yeah. of play. Oh, and two now, two Tejada. Actually, I, I, he swung and missed, but that, that's the first full swing that he's taken in a while. He's been, you know, trying to hit a line drive to right field in most of his at bats in, the, in today's ball game. He hit the ball hard last time up to the first baseman trying to go to right. The pitcher is basically entirely in the shadows now, as is the batter, with the bright background that the hitter is looking into. In the left center, David coming in a little bit. Had to flip the glasses down on that one. Holding it second is Chavez. Two down. First base. Tejada had 106 10. RBIs Scott. in the regular year. 278 average. Chavez 101 hit 282. But only two hits in 37 at bats for the two of them in this series. And yet Oakland, so far, they're doing just fine without him. 
They lead. Here's Hatterberg. He's been on base twice today and has scored twice. That's a strike. Not the ball from Wakefield. He walked leading off the second and scored a run. And then he singled leading off the sixth, which started a three run rally. And if you're Chavez at second base, you've got to fight to get a big lead because you want to try to score on a base hit to left field or any place else with two outs. There's a foul going over is Miller. And he falls into the seats. Does he have the ball? Yes, he's out. Yeah, he gave it up. So Bill Miller with a sensational catch to end the inning. You run out of room in a hurry chasing a foul pop in this yard. Four to three. Okay. Boston facing extinction if they can't come back in this one. Not tonight on Sunday night football. It'll be the Cleveland Browns and Pittsburgh Steelers. The Steelers beat the Browns three times last year but by a total of nine points. Coverage begins at 7:30 Eastern with NFL primetime. The Browns and the Steelers, two longtime rivals in the NFL, on ESPN and ESPN HD tonight. Trot Nixon. Last night he was the one with a two-run homer over the center field wall to keep the Red Sox going in this series. That was in the 11th inning. They find out that Trot had joined uh, many of his teammates in uh, getting his, uh, his haircut almost all off. Trot was not in the ball game last night until he came up as a pinch hitter in the 11th inning. And they wouldn't mind if he hit another one here. They're down a run. Nixon today has lined out to the first baseman and he has walked. Facing Rincon, the Oakland bullpen he is working. The right hand the switch hitting Miller is on deck. And another switch hitter, Baratek behind him. And that's ball one. Nixon only two hits and eleven career at bats against Rincon as Chad Bradford, the submarine ball throwing right hander, is getting ready. Sun shining, pitcher and the batter both in the shadows. And then slider. Got it by him. One ball, one strike. This is, I mean, you've met, said many times, Joe, this one's real tough when the hitter and the pitcher are both in the shadows with the bright background. Yeah, well, it's always difficult anytime you have shadows, but uh, this is probably the most difficult time. Ball and a strike. Williamson up in the Boston bullpen, as you saw. That's in the right center field. That's a base hit. Hustling over his Burns. Nixon, remember, he's got that bad calf, and he'll be content with a single. Bill Miller will come up. Third baseman, number 11, Bill Miller. And the question is, what do you do here? You got a batting champion hitting now. Do you bunt or do you go for it? Not a bad pitch. It was up a little bit, but give the hitter credit for finding the gap in right field. So there's Nixon, the possible tying run at first. Nobody out. Miller 0 for 1 with a walk in this game. He's not running. This could be two though. Chavez the second one. Ellis the first. Two double play. Man, he's good. <laughs> I tell you, he, that, he makes everything look so simple over there. I'm speaking of Chavez. I mean, that ball, that was a tough play, and he gives him a perfect throw at second every time. So that all Ellis has to do is play catch with the first baseman. I mean, this play, everything is made here by Chavez. I mean, the perfect throw. He gets in front of the ball, gets it over to him quickly, and Ellis, all he has to do is turn it over. I mean, you don't want to see a third baseman get rid of it more quickly. No, I mean, he just, but it looks so easy. Look at this. Boom. It's there. Look at that. I mean, you just play catch if you're the second baseman. Watch what he does. Well, we, we didn't see it soon enough. One of the things that Chavez does that a lot of other third basemen don't do, he opens up to throw to second base. He doesn't throw across his body ever, and he's so accurate. Here's Veritek. Now Veritek has been more powerful as a right-handed hitter. Ten homers and only 136 at bats. Right-handed, a 309 average right-handed. He has one homer in this series. He is 0 for 2 today, but he scored a run. 
And the Damon Homer back in the third. Four to three, Oakland ahead, last of the seven. And Cohn is in his second inning of work. When he used to be with Pittsburgh, remember he went from Pittsburgh to Cleveland in the deal that sent Brian Giles to Pittsburgh. At that time, he was probably the best left-handed reliever in the National League. And he was not a guy that would be an actual to swing on the appeal. Jim Joyce, the first base umpire, making the ruling, and so on, two to Baratak. But Rincon was always a guy who pitched one or two innings. He was not just a left-handed specialist. But when he got to Cleveland, they preferred, you know, that he came in to face a couple of lefties. But he's being used today the way he used to be used in Pittsburgh. This is his second inning of work. Bradford ready in the bullpen. And Rincon throws out Baratek. A seven-pitch inning for Rincon. Jose Guillen will be coming up. He said two. ESPN's presentation of the 2003 MLB Division Series. Brought to you by 1-800-COLLECT. Save a buck or two. Sailing on the Charles. You better do it while you still can. Starting to get cool here in New England. Coming up at 4 o'clock, 3 central on ESPN. The Yankees and the Twins. David Wells, who won his 200th game the final day of the year, will uh, try and get the Yankees into the league championship series. He's up against Johan Santana, the young Twins lefty, who was very impressive until his leg cramped up at Yankee Stadium last Tuesday. It's coming up on ESPN, 4 o'clock Eastern, 3 central. And if we're still on here, the start of that game will be carried on ESPN 2. Scott Williamson in for the Boston bullpen. He got the win here last night. He pitched a perfect 11th inning and then Trent Nixon homer in the last half of the inning. Williamson has pitched in every game of this series. He and the hitter. These were teammates most of this year in Cincinnati. Williamson was the closer. Guillen was the leading hitter. Well, Guillen has really swung the bat well today. Two singles and a line out. Miller robbed him back in the sixth inning. 2 and 0. On the outside for a strike. 2 and 1. Keith Folk, the Oakland closer, and you you speculated on that earlier, Joe, that they might go with Folk the last two if they were ahead. Well, he's getting ready for the eighth right now. Mel Hughes on deck. Blew that one right by. Two and two. Oakland has 11 hits in this game. They put 13 men on base. They lead four to three. Oh, Boston only has four hits. And then the slider low and inside. Full count. Williamson in this series, coming into this game, has been in all three of the previous games and has worked three scoreless innings with five strikeouts. Giving up a couple of hits. There's Mel Hughes. He's had a three for three game. That fastball, he hit it off his foot. Guillen playing with that broken bone in his uh, hand near his wrist. Now he hits one down off his foot. Three and two the count. Well, Guillen has been a big part of you know what the A's have done today. And you figured in the first run they scored by getting a base hit after Hattieberg had walked. And fouled back and out of play. Still three and two. And he didn't play in last night's ball game because of the soreness in his hand. So, I mean, I think that he's become a very integral part of this ball club. And they have a very good outfield when he's out there with Jermaine Dye and Burns. I mean, a lot of ground covered by that group. Still three and two. And he jammed him with that fastball. Damon with the glasses there, battling the sun. He makes the catch. Now, let's go to our uh, our friend Gary Miller. 
John, you know, Pedro Martinez took a lot of criticism for flying ahead of the team during certain trips this year when he was next to pitch. He was given an option today, and he chose to stay with the team, as did Barry Zito. Now, Zito's staying hoping he can celebrate a victory with his team, but nobody has checked out of their hotel yet. Logistically, they're going to stay in town. If they can clinch tonight, they'll be watching that Yanks Twins broadcast with special interest because they'll just stay on the East Coast if they should happen to open in New York. Thank you, Ian. Mel Hughes lifts a foul out of play. Grady Little, the Boston manager, said, hey, we're, we're hoping for a trip to Oakland. We'll be overjoyed if we could fly to Oakland. He said the A's, they are dreading a possible trip to Oakland. We're hoping to clinch it here today, as Gary said, and then find out if they're going to go home to face the Twins or go on to New York to start the, uh, the league championship series. And Slatter misses to Mel Hughes. Mel Hughes in his first postseason game today. Only playing because Ramon Hernandez has a strained lower back, and Mel Hughes has had three hits and three at bats, two singles and a triple. His triple drove in the tying run in the sixth inning. It came uh, moments before Jermaine dies. Two run homer put the Athletics ahead. Dontrell Willis, the Sensational Florida Marlins rookie in his first postseason game. Also had three hits yesterday. Of course, he also pitched. Two and one the count. So I guess it's not that big a deal that Mel Hughes has gotten three hits in his first postseason game. Well, all the, all the first timers are doing it. Well, it's a big deal for the A's because, I mean, they may not have scored many runs in this ballgame without him. I mean, you said he's three for three, but the last one, the triple, was the big blow. Going to keep to their offense. Three and two. That had some sinking action on that fastball. 93 miles an hour. Three and two. The count. Jermaine Dye has driven in three of the four Oakland runs today. He's on deck. to Miller. Over to Millar. Out number two. Well, here comes Dye. Trying to salvage it. Otherwise, a lost season. He's having a big day today. Well, if you're an RBI man, you do what you're supposed to do. You get the ball to the outfield, and then you know what he's been throwing you. You sit on it. You threw him a curveball, and he hit it out. That was the first home run hit by Oakland in this series. He died two for three today. The one time he didn't get a hit, Todd Walker made a diving catch of his little uh, squib back in the fourth inning with a runner at second. It could have been trouble if Walker had not caught it before it bounced. One ball to no strikes to Jermaine Dye. I mean, two years ago, Oakland would not even have made the postseason without Dye. He was great after they acquired him from Kansas City. It's a fastball for a strike. But in game four of the division series that year, two years ago against the Yankees, against an El Duque sinker, he hit the foul ball down off his left shin, broke his, uh, fractured the shin. And that began a, a, a series of injuries that he's had to battle with the last two years. One and two to count. Die. Hit only 172 this year. But obviously, Ken Maka views that as an aberration. He knows what's really there. Well, he got healthier and healthier as the season progressed. And he told me last week he felt great. And he struck him out. Another strong inning for Williamson. Four shutout innings for him. In his four games pitched in this series, the top of the order coming up for the Red Sox. Between the Yankees and the Twins, Jason Giam trying to help finish off Minnesota. It's coming up 4 o'clock Eastern time. It doesn't look like we'll be done with the Red Sox. We'll start this game on ESPN2 if that's the case, guys. All right. So here we go. Into the Boston half of the eighth inning. And Keith Folk, the outstanding Oakland closer, has come on to pitch. Johnny Damon. Leads it off the top of the Boston batting order. Damon takes ball one. He has hit a two-run homer today in three trips to the plate. No Mark Garcia Para 
and Todd Walker will follow. Back to the screen. Now Folk in that huge game one. The game that went deep into the night in Oakland, which Oakland finally won on the Ramon Hernandez bunt. Folk helped make that happen with three shutout innings. He threw 51 pitches in that game. And then came back and pitched another inning the next afternoon. Tejada okay, backhand. And he nice throws play. him out. Nice play. That's the defense that the Oakland A's have not showed us, you know, the first couple of games of the series. That's a tough play. That ball took a pop, came up on him with the speedy Damon running through the tough play. Now watch it the last. Watch this ball come up. See that? I mean, and he had to stay with it, and then he has to show this strong arm that gave able to get the speedy Damon. Nice play. Folk, ten times this year. Most closers are just one inning, and that's it. Folk had ten saves this year of at least two innings. That's a breaking ball for a strike to Nomar, who was 0 for 3 in this game. Folk known for his uh, great changeup. But he actually had a little pop on that fastball, too. Walker on deck. And a pop up foul. And back out of play. Going Any, to the count. Anytime you have a great changeup, it makes your fastball better because, you know, they're looking, they have to wait a little longer, make sure it's not the changeup, and it just adds about five or six inches to your fastball. Folk was in 72 games this year, pitched 86 and two thirds innings. That curveball is too low. He won nine games with one loss and had 43 saves. And in 86 and two-thirds innings, he only allowed 57 hits. He did give up 10 home runs, though. Nomar chased that high fastball and fouled it straight back. I think the interesting thing is he won nine games, you know, that he was in where it was a tie ball game. You look at most closers, and a lot of them even have losing records, two and three, three and four, or whatever. But he won the games that they put him in when it was a tie score. Well, and uh, it was very similar last year. Billy Cox was the closer, and Art Howe was the manager, and, and he had a very similar kind of a record. That one is hit well. Left center field. That ball is off the wall. Burns plays the carom as Nomar is standing at second with a double. pitch was but it was up well, I don't know it, it breaks down in a way actually not not down but it was away and no more hit it if he pulls that ball it's out and no more hitting that ball actually was hitting it against the wind the wind is blowing in from left and across toward right at the moment Todd Walker coming up. He's hit three homers in the series, including this one in the sixth inning. So here's Walker. A base hit to the outfield could suffice right here. No more at second. One out. And there's that changeup. 0 and 1. Walker joins three other Red Sox hitters. Who hit three homers in a single postseason series? Yaz did it in the World Series in 1967 against the Cardinals. And he buzzes him right under the chin with that fastball. Nomar hit three homers in a series against Cleveland in '98. John Ballantyne hit three against Cleveland in '99. Walker's got three in this one. I see a pirate second, one out. Four to three, Oakland. And four. Making Nomar go back to the bag. The outfield is backed up. Of course, there's a limit to how far back you can go in left field here, which is a, a small field to begin with. Ian, remember, in left field has a very strong arm. That's going to go right into the glove of Eric Burns and that was some good hitting there by Walker I mean he just stayed with that pitch and drove it the other way but he hit it too hard so now Manny Ramirez Number 24, Manny Ramirez. 
They've been expecting Manny to break out. They've been hoping that he's about to break out. Now they're pleading with him to break out. He's the big RBI man, but he has not had much luck with Keith Folk over the years, although his one hit against Folk was a home run. Today he has had one hit in three at bats. One of only two hits he's had in the series. Now, Ken Mock is going to go out to the mound. We have the Mel Hughes already out there, the catcher, Tejada to the mound. And now they're all going to go out there with the manager, Maka. Well, we saw Maka walk Manny Ramirez last night in a tough situation, in an RBI situation. I don't think he's going to walk him here, but I think they want to make sure that they do not make any mistakes in certain areas of the plate. The point is they've been getting him out inside off the plate, but if you try to go inside and you don't get it all the way in off the plate, you know, you're pitching to his strength. So Manny Ramirez, the great RBI man, but the Athletics have been able to shut him down in this series. Manny, with only the two hits in 15 at bats, and he has left 10 men on base. He has ended seven innings during the series. Last time he played in the division series was four years ago against Boston. And the Red Sox shut him down in that one. He was only one for 18 in that series. He had hit 357 in the division series before that. Red Sox need a hit. No more at second, two down. They're down by a run. And Folk with a slider off the outside. I think you're going to see them stay away from him unless they get ahead in the count. Then he may try to come off the plate inside to finish the at bat. But you do not want to make a mistake inside with a one run lead here in Boston. And with the big left handed slugger, Ortiz, on deck. No more ready to go in anything from second. Two down. Fastball on the outside for a strike. And Manny knows that they have been pitching him inside. And the first pitch was away. He's thinking, well, they might come inside again. But he took that pitch to see. And I think he'll realize he's just going to have to go after the ball wherever it is. Now field backed up all the way around. Well, they go inside there. Strike two. Manny seemed to be surprised by that call. Well, the smart pitch by Folk. Two pitches away. Now you come inside. And gets the acceptable range there, just hits the line within two inches of being over the plate there. One and two to count. Now back to the outside, but missing. Two and two. I mean, these pitchers, the whole season, could well be riding on each pitch. Boston's best RBI man at the plate, Oakland's best relief pitcher on the mound. And a base hit could tie this game. Curveball. That's into left field. Guillen's got the strong arm. He's in shallow left. They're going to hold him up. Man. And it's a good thing they did. Now that wasn't going to be close at the plate. And Nomar almost ran through the sign because he was being held up from the moment he rounded third. And Guillen was hoping that he would go. So Manny got the hit and still. Doesn't get the RBI. Fenway worked against the Red Sox on this one. Well, he threw him a curveball. He hadn't thrown him one in the entire sequence. He threw it. Now watch. When he picks the ball up, now Manny, I mean, Nomar has to stop quickly, and that ball comes all the way in in the air. Manny finally gets the base hit he's been looking for. He says yes, but he did not realize that he wasn't going to be able to score because it was a ground ball. He thought he might be able to score. But that's what the strong arm again in left field will do for you. As I said, this is their best defensive outfield. And playing very shallow because the field is so shallow to begin with. Here's Ortiz inside. Ortiz has not had a hit in this series. But he does have some success or has had in the past against Folk. Four hits, 14 at bats, including a home run. And now they're pleading with Ortiz to finally get that big hit. First and third, two down. And he fouls that one back onto the roof. 
A ball and a strike. Ortiz at a fly ball to left field against Folk on Thursday in Oakland that would have been off the wall here at Fenway. The only time he faced him in that ball game. A ball and a strike. Garcia Parra at third. Ramirez at first. Ryan Tyler. He's Proudman. Two and one. And Ramirez helping uh, lead the cheers from first base. Some are cheering and some are praying. Two and on the count. And he lays off. Well, that, that, well, that, that ball, I heard it up here too. He's saying the ball fouled. I heard it. You can hear it all the way up here. But the home plate umpire obviously didn't hear it. Well, they should ask somebody, ask one of the other umpires. Well, I guess they're not going to, but I thought I heard something up here as well. Well, no, Hughes, very upset. He hit the glove with his back. Well, he should be given first base. Yeah. Now he's felt the ball, felt, felt something, and he thought it was a tip. I know I heard something. And now Ortiz, unable to get that pitch. Like that went down a little bit more, but still in, still crowding it. Three and two. Garcia Parra at third. Ramirez at first, and even with three and two and two down, the first baseman. Hatterberg stays in the bag with him. Keeping that a hole open on the right side. There goes Ramirez. That ball is hit well. Deep to right. Dive. Can't get to it. Off the wall. One run is in. Here comes Ramirez. And the throw goes right to the middle of the infield. And Boston has gone ahead on the first hit of the series by David Ortiz. And it came at a big time. Five to four, Boston. Well, they've had some other magical come from behind victories here this season. And so it's never over. And they're going to pinch run for Ortiz, who has a bad knee. And Ortiz will get the hero's welcome as he heads back to the dugout for the big crowd at Fenway. Nobody was better in the clutch in the stretch run than was David Ortiz. And his first hit of this series is huge. Now Kevin Malone with Brown at second. He changed up. One one. And the chant comes up now at Fenway. MVP. I was wondering if, if Folk was going to actually pitch around Ortiz or try to get him to chase something because he had a right handed hitter on deck that he went right after him. Five to four. Boston is leading. Dye battling the sun makes the ground. Boston a double by Garcia Parra off the wall the single by Ramirez and then Ortiz launching one over the head of Dye and Boston suddenly has a five to four lead. It's the last chance for the athletics to the ninth inning Burns Ellis and Durazo do up. Burt pitched a uh, a perfect eighth inning. Now Eric Burns taking ball one inside lead off man Mark Ellis will follow. And then Rubiel Durazo do up third in the inning. Chavez will be due for David Ortiz with the big hit for Boston. Now can the bullpen hang on to it. This bullpen by the way they pitched four perfect innings last night including the 11 innings thrown by Williamson who got the win in that ball game. They also pitched the two shutout innings at the end of the Thursday afternoon game in Oakland. Williamson had one of those. 
And today the bullpen's gone two and two thirds shutout innings with Wakefield and Williamson. Eight and two thirds shutout innings from this bullpen now in the last three games. And that's a strike with a fastball. Two and one. The bullpen will be ready. Embry, the left hander, is up. And Timlin, one of last night's heroes, with three perfect innings himself, also up again. Williamson, the former Cincinnati closer, not trying to close off his own win to keep the Red Sox alive for a trip to Oakland. Two and two. Burns is one for three in this game. Damian Jackson now playing second base for the Red Sox, by the way. The uh, defensive change made. Jackson in for Walker. He struck him out. Good slider. He got ahead of him with the fastball and then finishes him off with a slider. Out of the strike zone. Game one in Oakland, Boston had a one-run lead into the ninth inning and could not hold it. There was a walk, then a hit batsman, and ultimately a Rubio Durazo got a hit to tie the game that went extra innings. Ellis, and that's a strike. I mean, for the Athletics, I mean, they just can't be. This is beyond belief. Could this be happening again? Way inside and off the glove. A Veritek. One ball, one strike. I mean, they had that two games to none lead against the Yankees two years ago, and they were going home. And yet they lost three in a row. They had a two games to one lead last year and lost the last two to the Twins. One ball, one strike to count. And that breaking ball right there. Strike two. Well, Scott Williamson was a closer before, so he has a closer mentality. And that's probably why Jimmy Williams decided to leave him out there instead of bringing someone else out of the bullpen. Yeah, why not? He's, he's throwing great in this series. Four and a third shutout innings. Seven strikeouts. Make it eight. He has struck out three in a row, including Die to win the eighth inning. Two down. They're getting ready to head to the airport now. And Pedro Martinez will be handed the ball tomorrow at the Coliseum if Williamson can get this final out. Pedro would be going on full rest against Barry Zito, who would be working on short rest for the first time in his career. Durazo who drove in the tying run in game one in the ninth inning. Bill Miller in shallow left. He's got it. And the Red Sox have tied the series. They're going to head to Logan for the flight to Oakland and a game five with Pedro and Zito. The Red Sox have risen from the dead. And for the Athletics, an all too familiar story. For the Athletics, they lost their starter, Hudson, after one. And even so, they had a lead into the eighth. And their best pitcher for late in the game on the mound, Folk, but he could not hold it, not this time. Well, the one thing you have to say about the Red Sox, and, and that's what good hitters do. They just keep swinging, and eventually something good happens. I mean, they were struggling. Manny Ramirez, he got the big hit, and then followed by even bigger hit by David Ortiz. But these guys have been producing for the Red Sox all year, and right here at the brink of disaster, they do it again. So you have to give them credit. Nothing is ever settled here in this ballpark. Well, 
Scott Williamson was throwing hard. He gets a fastball away and Durazo pops it up. And we're going to Oakland. So the Boston Red Sox with a five to four win. This time it was the Red Sox who come from behind against the other team's bullpen. The Red Sox bullpen again was sensational for three and two thirds shutout innings. Johnny Damon who propelled the comeback in the beginning with a homer and a great throw. He's standing by in the field with Gary Miller. Johnny is supposed to be the big guys in this order that do the, the power hitting, but somebody had to do it. You guys finally woke up your bat today. Are you prouder of the home run or the throw that nailed Gian? Uh, probably the uh, throw that nailed Gian because um, if I don't get them, they've got second and third, and um, we're in deep trouble right there. But I, I'm just happy um, with our players. You know, um, David has a guy that hit this whole um, series. He comes up big for us. And, um, you know, we said it. We're going to play in front of our home fans, give them a great show, and we're going to take it back to Oakland. We, we believed in ourselves. You know, you weren't here back then, but Lou Merloni said one of the seven guys who was here when they were down two games to none to Cleveland has said, right after you guys lost game two out there, you started talking about it in your clubhouse. Have you felt, if you got a little room to breathe, that you had the driver's seat then? Well, we, we feel like we have the driver's seat because we have Pedro going tomorrow. And, um, uh, we know Pedro is going to be on so I, I'm just uh, happy. I mean the fans have been awesome. I mean this is what playoff baseball is all about here here at Fenway. There's nothing quite like it. You know Nixon was shamed into getting his hair cut. He did it himself during the game and hit a game winning homer. Low cut his after he pitched so great last night. What about you now Johnny? Well, you know, I've been taking enough abuse about my mullet all year, and finally it's get, getting away from the mullet stage. And, you know, I, I've got to try to look good during the offseason, you know. Um, you know, I told the guys, it's not the hair, it's the um, confidence you hold within yourselves, and the haircut's not going to do a difference. If they believe in it, um, it's going to work for them. But me, I like the long hair, and um, it's good to stand out. Okay, well, best of luck on the flight, and uh, hopefully they can change things for their sake out in Oakland, John. All right, Gary, and is it the hair? Is it the rally karaoke guy? Is it cowboying up? Or are they just maybe maybe just good? I think it's a combination of all those things. I think they did cowboy up because they never did give in. And that, I mean, this is a good Boston team, and I was surprised that it took them this long to break out, but they picked the right time. But they'll still have to go out and beat Zito. I mean, it's not an over-and-done situation because Pedro's pitching. Great matchup tomorrow, 4 o'clock or 8 o'clock Eastern time, depending on what happens with the other game at Minnesota today. The final score here, 5-4. to four. The Red Sox have come from behind to beat Oakland to set up a game five for Joe Morgan and Gary Miller and our entire ESPN crew. This is John Miller from Fenway Park. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast. We're going to send you now to the Metrodome and Gary Thorne.